Welcome to the February 24th meeting of the Rockville Center Board of Education. Can I have a motion to retire to executive session to discuss specific personnel appointments, contract negotiations, and the IEPs of students? A second? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. We will return in public at 7.30 p.m. Good evening. Welcome to the February 24th meeting of the Rockville Center Board of Education. Please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have emergency exits on all sides of the auditorium. We are live in the high school auditorium tonight. And you can watch the meeting on YouTube and through the school channel. Tonight's meeting is a public work session and budget work session. In addition to those of us at the dais, we're being joined this evening by Mrs. Tara Algerio Vento, who's our district medical officer and nurse practitioner. Mr. John Murphy, our high school principal. Ms. Sonia Hood, our central director of curriculum and our assistant, Suzanne Flanagan. So thanks for joining us. I'd like to just, before we start the meeting, call attention to an email that you may have received recently from the Rockville Center Education Foundation. Uh, in lieu of their traditional gala this year, they will be looking to host a, a new event called their Big Night Inn, and it'll be held on April 24th, 2021. Uh, this is a genius pivot from their event where they normally have 300 people at a country club, and we know we can't do that right now. So I would like to just highlight uh, the great work that the foundation does for the district and hope that you will consider joining them for their virtual trivia night that will be held in April. Um, their primary mission is to raise funds in a very creative way and they have generously supported our scholarships and grants annually that directly benefit the kids of Rockville Center. So I really hope that you will um, consider joining them this year for their event. Um, we're just going to review the meeting schedule coming up. Um, we have some changes, uh, actually some additions to the meeting schedule I would like to highlight. Um, back in January, our meeting was forced to go virtual due to the closure of Southside High School. At that point, we were looking ahead towards February and reversed our February meeting so that the meeting after the virtual one would be our regular board meeting, which then switches it making tonight a public work session. To allow for public input and questions regarding the school's reopening, which I know we have um, many parents interested in, we actually added a meeting which will function similarly to a regular board meeting where the public will have that opportunity to interact with um, cabinet members, administrators, and a panel of people that I'm going to describe. Um, so that will be next Wednesday, March 3rd at 7 p.m. We have opportunities for you to attend in person and you can also attend that virtually. It will be recorded as well. So um, for that panel, we have everybody sitting up here, plus um, Mrs. Algiero Vento will be joining us again, Mr. Murphy will be joining us again, thank you very much, and Ms. Sheila McGinn. So we hope you can join us for one of our upcoming meetings. And then the meeting following that would be on March 11th. Um, so tonight in the agenda, we'll open the microphone for the public and our opportunity for visitors on the proposed 2021-2022 budget, section for comments and questions pertaining to the budget. Uh, please be respectful of the use of the microphone this evening, its purpose, and the rules. When you approach the microphone, please state your name and address before making your comment or asking your question. You will be restricted to one visit to the microphone and a three-minute limit. Our district clerk will be keeping time for us. You're not permitted to address any individual member of the board, nor may you mention the name of any student, staff member, or community member. If these rules are violated, we may ask you to step down from the microphone. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Chang. We have lots on the agenda, and we'll get right to it. Thank you, Madam President. Before I introduce our first guest, I just wanted to make sure that I, I run through some of the information that I provided over the past uh, week. Um, as we return back from the February break, uh, we as a dis district made a decision to set a date in terms of returning all our students uh, in a phased-in process. Um, and I just want to give people the, the thinking, and it's, I wrote it out in the messaging that went out in the email, but some of the factors that played the major role is that during the break, we were able to procure uh, the desk barriers, which all came in uh, and were dispersed to the middle school as well as the high school. That coupled with the fact that we finally got some data information about our staff, which we had put a survey out, 
uh, with the vaccination rate and people who have either started to get vaccinated or completed their vaccinations at over 65% um, at the middle and high school. So uh, that and finally uh, firming up a partnership uh, in which uh, South Nassau has gone into with Long Beach, Oceanside, Island Park, as well as Rockwell Center to allow for our teachers to get priority vaccinations on a given day up to 75, but that, um, that it is 75 of our teachers to be vaccinated weekly uh, moving forward for the next few weeks. Uh, that put us in a pretty good situation. Uh, the biggest factor in terms of making our decision was, again, the dust barriers being in. We knew that it took some time over the summer when we were talking about the potential of bringing everybody in, but having that in place allowed us to start making some decisions and a phased in process and an approach that would bring our seniors in first, as well as our eighth graders uh, and all our special ed, remaining special ed students that get services would be coming in, in that first wave. The following week, we would look at the ninth and sixth grade uh, coming in, and then the following week after that, before we even go into break, uh, to be able to have everyone back into to our schools uh, at that point. Um, a couple of key things to note, we will, uh, we will have in-person learning from that point on um, after the 23rd, after the 22nd, and we will also have the remote option available uh, for anyone who chooses to remain in the remote option. Now, the key in terms of how we continue the success is to ensure that everyone does um, all the things that the guidelines have put out there, and I've said this multiple times uh, in public, we need all the help that we can get. We need everyone to do all the right things outside of schools uh, because that is gonna be a high impact in terms of what happens to us moving forward. Additionally, we are, we've been able to triage and get back to a, a level where it wasn't what it was during the winter breaks and the couple of breaks that we had, uh, which puts us in prime position to be able to try to finish out uh, with everybody in towards the end of the year. Now, what you're gonna get more details on uh, next week uh, at the meeting will be some information again from Principal Murphy and Principal McGinn about uh, the details that entail each of those buildings, what will lunches be like, uh, some of the other details in terms of scheduling, uh, how everyone's gonna be returning, looking at all those other things. Now, all these things, again, contingent upon everyone following the safety guidelines. Um, we are, uh, prioritizing uh, safety and our decisions are all based on the health and well-being of our staff as well as our students. And that's the whole picture that I wanna try to put out there that it is about our, our staff as well as our students. Uh, and we are, we're in a good position to be able to do so and I'd like to go on into that trajectory. And I said at the last board meeting, it's not just about getting in, it's about sustaining uh, and being able to sustain that uh, throughout the course of the year. So we'll do that. Uh, we're looking forward to, to being able to provide that avenue. Um, additionally, again, sports are up and running. As we get through um, the first wave and everyone comes back in, we'll also be providing um, additional reentry points. Uh, I know that people are maybe hesitant to come in at first, but as people start coming in, uh, depending on you know what point of the year it may be, they, people may want to return, students may want to return, and we wanna be able to provide that opportunity for those students. I also know that the middle school and the high school have uh, sent out a survey uh, requesting to uh, select either to be remote or to be in person so that they can garner information and have their classrooms prepped and ready to go. Uh, additionally, we'll also have another meeting with the reopening committee uh, this week uh, and well, next week, I'm sorry. Uh, Suzanne's probably looking at me saying this week. Um, now, next week, uh, just to follow up with some additional information uh, and then hopefully be able to provide further uh, information uh, at the forum as well. So that's kind of all the things that are going on. I'll save my budgetary comments till when we get to there. Uh, but with that being said, I think it's apropos to introduce our district medical officer to give us an update uh, on all the things going on with COVID and, and her information. Good evening, Board of Education, Administration, and parents. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you and update you on what goes on behind the scenes when we're confronted with a COVID case. Whether it's in school related or community related, it affects us internally at schools. Last year when we heard about COVID, it was unknown to us. In July and August when we set out to plan our protocols, we were, un we were un in uncharted waters, uncharted waters we've never seen before this pandemic. 
and we had to make protocols based on educated guesses. As the months have come bust and we have more robust objective data, our protocols have really honed into our, what makes sense? What can we learn from? What can we debate with as far as protocols, adhering to, loosening up, making it stricter, et cetera? There's lots of variables. When you talk about one case, that is just one case. Not every single case is handled the same way. Why? Because there are various variables. If the child is young, are they a poor mask wearer? Are they intoler not tolerating the mask at all and they're constantly asking for mask breaks? Was there eating going on in the classroom? Was there singing? The duration of the singing. Was there wind instruments being played? The duration of that. How many students were there? The distance. Various reasons. Transportation. Were the windows open? Were people wearing masks in their car as they're carpooling? The list goes on and on with variabilities. So not every case is handled the same way. Not every case looks the same. So that's why everyone, I, I'm here to educate everyone on what goes on behind the scenes when we work in conjunction with Nassau County Department of Health in making our decisions on whether to quarantine or whether to educate someone that they may have been exposed and to self-monitor closely. So when we are notified of, um, of a case and it's in the school, meaning that if they were positive, say on Friday, and they were in the building Wednesday and Thursday, we always ask onset of symptoms. So if they had symptoms Thursday night and they were in the school on Wednesday, we would contact Trace two days before their onset of symptoms. If they came to school with no symptoms and just tested because maybe they're going on vacation, maybe they were a direct contact that they just found out about, if they have no symptoms and it's the test date, we use that as the day of symptoms, so to speak. So it's very frustrating for people to say, how could there be no contact tracing being done? It's in the school. Sometimes they don't come to school at all. They get sick Monday morning. Sometimes they don't come to school because it's a, a red day and they're a blue day. So that's the reason why the letters seem very confusing to people. And I know many of you have reached out to me asking, how could there be no contact tracing being done? And then sometimes people ask me, why are we quarantining? How could my child be quarantined when they don't know how, there's only three people or four people near them. We can never give very specific information for confidentiality, but we try to do the best in explanation. So with conjunction with Department of Health, we always deal with the protocols. So right now what we're using, and next week it may be different, but right now how we're quarantining is in the classroom setting in elementary school, because they're more closely confined, less than six feet, they make us do three to the left, three to the right, and front and back. And then grab somebody else if maybe they socialized, there's a child that maybe has sensory issues, they don't sit in their seat, there's other variabilities that go on. At the secondary level, we have six foot, at least six feet, so therefore we can, we can quarantine less. So we tend to do the front child, the back child to the positive case, and the left and the right. Now, sometimes we don't grab anybody because they, they were very far away, more than six feet. But usually, they're at least six feet. So I know the CDC guidance says six feet, but in Nassau County, we err on the side of caution as a school district. Many school districts close during the quarantine period. We like to stay open. Many school districts close for contact tracing a day or two. My department, the nursing department, and the administrators have worked tirelessly to contact trace throughout the night and evening. Now, yes, sometimes we have closed. Why? Sometimes operationally, meaning it wasn't that there was many staff members that needed to be quarantined, but what was going on behind the scenes? Maybe there was a lot of maternity leave. Maybe there was a lot of sick days that somebody was not feeling well. Maybe they had personal days that they were taking, and there was a number of staff that they couldn't do without. So that was the building principal's decision. Or sometimes we have a case that we find out at 10.30 at night. How can we adequately contact Trace at 10.30 at night? Many people are sleeping already. So we decide to close for contact tracing purposes that way. Then in January, we really were confronted at the high school level with numerous social events, that resulted in up to 27 cases positive within a five-day period. 
So we had no choice. We could not safely say we can keep the building open with that volume coming in as positives. So what we do on the outside really impacts us inside. Now, what did we do to protect everyone as best as we can? We have the easy screen app that we ask you to fill out daily. We have temperature checks when you walk in the building. We have you sitting at least six feet apart during lunch. We have barriers, trifold barriers. We have alcohol-based sanitizers. We have PPE that if they break their mask, we replace it. Staff has sanitizing wipes to use. Faculty are educated on the health and safety maintenance of using the products and PPE properly. <clears throat> we had educational videos in the beginning of the year. Each school nurse that the child was familiar with saw her on the screen. They talked about hand washing importance before and after a meal. They talked about mask safety, wearing it on top of their nose and covering their mouth. If it's saturated, if it ripped, to replace it. All these minor things make a big difference. We also have the alcohol-based hand sanitizer, freestanding stations in the gymnasium, high volume areas, entrance day, entrance ways, et cetera. Besides the PPE, we also provided educational friendly videos. Maybe the students were afraid of COVID. They heard a lot of things going on on the news, in the community. We wanted to make them not afraid to come to school. So that's what we did in September. Now, you want about numbers. I know a lot of quarantining cases, et cetera. So what we do is we work on the medical protocols, and then we worked on how many people were quarantined based on school-related versus non-school-related. And may I share those numbers? Okay. I need glasses because I can't see. Sorry. Okay. So overall, district-wide, the students quarantined school-related cases was 926. School, non-school related students quarantined was 674. Staff quarantined school related cases, 198. Staff quarantined non-school related was 236. Travel quarantine for students district wide was 156. And staff travel quarantine for staff district wide 15. There are a total of 325 cases that are on the dashboard since we opened up. And there are 13 cases that were in school transmission related. That's an average of around 3.9 to 4%. <clears throat> now when we talk about travel protocol, we talk about what New York State relates to us. Meaning, if you leave the re at New York State and go to a restricted state, they make us quarantine you in the sense that if you don't test out, we have to quarantine you for 10 days from the day you return to New York State. If you choose to test out, it's up to three days before leaving that restricted state. And then when you return, four days, so you, you return, three days later, you test out. So that's the fourth day. If you can provide those two negative tests, you can return. Now, unfortunately, there's this whole conundrum. The CDC releases something, and then it has to wait. There's a lag time before New York State Department of Health creates a written guidance. So Governor Cuomo may say something that he wants to do, but Nassau County can't act on it, the Department of Health, until New York State puts it in guidance, meaning written guidance. And I'll give you an example. <clears throat> He just said that if the CDC and Cuomo agreed that once you have your second dose of the vaccination, two weeks later, you won't need to quarantine if you travel or if you're a direct contact. Yet, it's not in the guidance. So we're waiting on it. So it looks like we're going against the CDC. There's always a lag time with the state. So we have to be patient. We're aware of the changes, but we can't create the medical FAQs without it going into guidance for us. The 90-day immunity, the New York State Department of Health does not acknowledge it, meaning if you were recently diagnosed with COVID, you don't have to quarantine. Nassau County Department of Health acknowledges that. So I called Nassau County and I said, well, what about the travel quarantine? It's coming up February break, April break. What happens if we have the 90-day immunity? They said, unfortunately, New York State 
controls the travel, so they don't acknowledge the 90-day immunity at all. So I didn't believe that. I called New York State's Department of Health myself, and I was told that they don't acknowledge the 90-day immunity, so even if you had COVID, you'll have to test out or, or, or quarantine 10 days if you travel to a restricted state. But in the school district, the local Department of Health can decide to, to implement the 90-day immunity in reference to direct contacts. So it looks like there's a lot of conflict. So it looks like sometimes we're not up to date on what we need to do, but our hands are tied sometimes because we're waiting for guidance to come out. Sometimes you'll see a revision. Originally, quarantine was 14 days. Then the end of December, New York State adopted the CDC guidance and made it 10. So I'm hoping in the future, it's a free-flowing document that we'll get changes. Now, what can we do to keep us opened and safe as possible? We really need the cooperation of the community, the parents. We need transparency. We need reporting accuracy. All positive cases, whether they're remote students, whether or not we were quarantined as far as those days that we were closed and we were remote, whether it was a holiday break, we need those numbers. We need to know if anybody has interacted outside of school that were positive because we have to make sure that they're not coming in, they're not playing sports, they're not gonna spread transmission in the school. The whole idea is to keep us safe and open. Okay, does, does anybody have any questions? Do you want to take them during or you want to take them at the end? Excuse me? Do you want to take them during your presentation? It doesn't matter, yeah. If they have questions, I don't want them to get confused on what I'm saying and then they forget what they want to ask. Um, I'll just say, you know, I'll, okay. I'll make a comment okay. and also read something. I, I don't know, I am getting a lot of feedback from people that it, they're just confused. There's no, nowhere do they know what they're supposed to do. Uh, it's difficult to find it because you have a piece here and a piece here. So I think that we, as a school district, need to be more transparent about the guidelines we are taking. And I'll, I'll read one example. This is from an employee of the school district. And the letter says, you know, you must submit a cl clearance note from your provider stating you completed the 10-day quarantine and are not um, contagious and you may return on X date or a copy of a release from quarantine letter, email, or text from the Department of Health by visiting a website you put there. When you go to that website, it doesn't give you any avenue to get the release form that you need because your situation isn't there. So even for our employees, it's confusing. What do I do? Which situation? Because it's either your direct contact that you can do a no, quarantine release. No, it was travel or related, positive. didn't follow the rules for traveling. But then when directed where to go, there's no resource or no, no explanation to help them get through it. So that is, that is a, we've revised it and we've told people that when they are quarantining for the travel, if they go to the provider and test out, because a lot of times they just did the four day test, they can submit that. And if not, then we spoke to Department of Health and they said, we're okay just to let them come back. So that was as of this week. Again, things change constantly. Mr. I Richard. understand that, but is it printed somewhere that, they, that your employee, the employees of the school district can say, okay, that's what I have to do? Because that's the response I'm getting from the general public. It's like, uh, what do I do? Do I do this? Do I do that? I can't find so it or I figure if it out. Travel just changed on Monday, okay. and I will change it this week, but there's a lot of things that I was working on this week. Sports okay. clearances, sport physicals, so that was my precedence right now, my priority. However, if you're a direct contact or a positive, there's no level of confusion because when you go to that website, it, there is automatically the quarantine release information that you need to complete and it automatically comes back to your email. I'm, I'm not speaking to that situation. I'm speaking to right. a specific situation of a specific employee who was like, what do I do? Because it doesn't tell me. That's all I'm trying mm -hmm. to address. No, no, what I'm saying- And I think the public also has great confusion of what to, what's the right thing to do. People, people have come to me. I went away. I went to see colleges. I then came back. I took my test here. And I understand it's somewhere deep in the website, but I asked, I, I just would ask for, who does this? New York State Department of Health. They make a very simple form. This is everything. Do this and you have to do that. If this happens, you have to do that. I, it's my belief that I would like to see the district create something like this if this is gonna be the life we're leaving, leading. Because this is simple, and as this changes, you can change the form and send it out instead of the medical questions, the frequently asked questions. Because you're saying, 
five times, it's five days after you answer one frequently asked question, it changes. But we don't remove, or we don't change, or we don't make it that clear for, for our population to, to do it. That's so in, re in, in regards to your question, right before, um, right after, excuse me, the holiday break, we sent out the new travel protocol. Mr. Chang put it in the medical FAQs. We sent it through school messenger stating, check the medical FAQs, travel quarantine has changed. During February, we reiterated going to, to, to cite back, back to the medical FAQs. And right before February break occurred, either the 11th or the 12th, Mr. Chang in his letter reiterated the travel advisory protocol. This, this happened the end of January. <clears throat> no, no, I understand that. But there, you said there's a lot of people that were questioning they travel to colleges, et cetera. They didn't follow, a lot of times they didn't follow the, every step of it and we're obligated to adhere to the travel protocol. So there's always that conundrum of, I've only tested in New York, I haven't tested before leaving the restricted state. Right. I think also we should remind people, they should, cause should contact you if they have specific questions Correct. about their personal situations mm -hmm. because, because things are changing and it is confusing yes. for people. If they spoke to you three months ago and asked you a question, it may not be the same. So you're open to people calling you, the school nurses, the staff knows who to call, but the parents should start with their building nurse first, or they can contact you or email you on a personal issue. Yes, correct? and they, uh -huh. they, are, they, are very, they know I'm very easily accessible. I get several hundred emails a day on questions, and I'm always accessible. I always answer within a, a 24 to 48 hour window. Okay. So, I, I know how overworked you all are. I know how difficult this is, so you're adding the burden of adding the possibility of 3,000 families calling you to answer a specific question. That just doesn't make any sense, whereas if there were guidelines as simple as what New York State puts out in color, it tells you exactly what to do, wouldn't that be more beneficial to your Department of Nurses so they're not so overwhelmed with, with how many X calls? Well, so we, have, we have the FAQs that address it, and there's still but, always confusion. But they're in different places. You can look 15 FAQs down and see something and then look up there. Uh, Aren't they just all... always in the COVID resources folder? Yeah, yeah. No, you have some in the medical part, some in the COVID. Right. So it's not, it's, it's not crystal. I think and... Dr. Leahy wants to answer you, John. Excuse yeah. me? I think Dr. Leahy wants I... to answer you. Oh, okay. right? I, I will say that um, the, t Tara is very accessible, <laughs> night and day. <laughs> Trust me, I know that. And, and uh, she's very willing to answer questions. And sometimes, despite even seeing it in writing and reading it, we need a medical interpretation. But short of that, the medical FAQs are, are front and center on the website. We can always do better. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We'll take a look to see if there's something we can make more clear. But they're, uh, they're very easy to find. They're right on the website. They're not that long. That really should be the first source because those FAQs are kept up by, uh, by Tara. Uh, mm -hmm. as soon as you know changes come in or as quickly thereafter as, as she possibly can make those changes. Right. So if I may begin again, let me talk about if there is a positive case, what it looks like. So automatically we notify the students, the parents of the students that they are to be quarantined. We give them verbally the instructions. We give them the recommendations if they ask when should they test their child. And we always say between three to five days from exposure, ideally on day five. And then we send a written notification of everything we reiterated over the telephone conversation. Nursing staff in the building usually assists as well as administrative teams. I've sat many a nights with my administrative team at the high school. I've sat with Dr. Leahy many a nights until 11, 12 o'clock making sure that the quarantine process has gone through. After we notify the students, the parents of the students, we also interview, I personally interview staff to see whether or not they need to quarantine. Once we do that, we go back to the building principal and we let him or her know the impact that the quarantine has done to the building to see if they can maintain the classroom setting or whether or not they need to close a particular grade level or a particular building. And then I also notify Mr. Chang, the Board of Ed he notifies, I notify the cabinet and then we discuss the impact that it has on the district as far as the case, each case by case. And then Ms. Suzanne Flanagan and Mrs. Wong, they help me with sending out the community letters of education. And then the Department of Health and I decide on the quarantine protocols if they need to change based on the next new case, okay? But again, it's always a partnership in conjunction with Department of Health for Nassau County. And Nassau County guidances 
may be different than Suffolk County. We saw that with sports. Now, Su Suffolk County required testing. Nassau County did not. So there's lots of different differences between the commissioners of health. Each county has different guidelines. So it's, it's very confusing to many, but we have to adhere to Nassau County. Okay. Tara, on the, on, say, say for close contact, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. uh, the county has its guidelines. Yes. And you call in the county and you explain your situation. Uh, I'm looking at the BOCES close contact explanation. Mm -hmm. The same county, the same attorneys who are advising both the, our school district and theirs, and they're very different than what you're talking about. How, in what how sense, is that? Mr. O'Shea? What's their, I'm not familiar with if their protocols. If your close contact is within six feet of a positive case for more than 10 to 15 minutes for 48 hours before case symptoms onset to case isolation, exposed to or give care to positive case, which I'm assuming is a, is a staff member, direct touching, shared food, and exposed to sneeze, sneezing, coughing, or talking. So you're saying someone in, in your, your quarantine, you're gonna put them out for three, three students away? No, I just said it was, it was 15 minutes or more, less than six feet. But we are at least six feet at the secondary level and less than six feet at the primary level. So our protocols are based on what goes on with each case scenario. So just so I can check, on the secondary level, what, what is your guidance for a close contact? Less than six feet or six feet, at least six feet or less, and more than 15 minutes, 15 minutes or more. Okay, and at the elementary, as you're going three to the right, three to the left? Yeah, because they're not six feet, sir. So we always- I think the guidance the is the same, it's just that they're more condensed in the elementary, exactly. is the way she's explaining I, I, it. I understand that, right. but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at three students as more than six feet, but that's okay. Oh, confusion that people are coming to me with is BOCES or other Nassau County schools are in the Nassau County Department of Health and other schools are doing different things than we're doing. And in the, in the live stream this afternoon, you said that we do modify or we interpret and we can manipulate or change the Nassau, Nassau County Department of Health guidelines. And if that's what we decide to do, that's fine but people wanna know. Not that we change, we use objective data. So I gave you an example during live stream that Nassau County is very strict with high risk populations. In our self-contained classrooms, they have significant underlying medical conditions. So in the beginning, when we were all new to these protocols, we closed down the classrooms. But I had enough objective data to have a dialogue with Nassau County Department of Health to ask if I can keep the classroom open on the third case that we've had during the school year, and they allowed it, because they knew I collect data objectively, and we all look to educate all of us, all of our protocols. So it's not that I push back, it's a dialogue, it's a conversation. And they educate me on things that may work, and I educate them on things I see working on my end. So we, we, can't, we have the ability to modify the specifics of the Nassau County Department of Health, and other schools have their position to modify the way they see fit. So it's not, I mean, it's not set, like, Department of Health has a certain guideline, but school districts can take it and, and tweak it a little. Well, it depends. I mean, we're a very fortunate school district. We did trifold barriers. We have huge amounts of PPE in the buildings. I can't say that all Nassau County schools are that fortunate. Yeah. So when you speak say, to the Department of Health, you say that we have shields, we have masks, we have uh, yes. hand sanitizers, all that, that all plays into their interpretation of how we should quarantine or close contact? Yes, and I have objective data that when we self-contained classrooms we closed, based on our PPE and health and safety protocols implemented in those classrooms, we had no in-school transmission. So in the third case, I was able to provide that data to show that what we're doing is effective. So therefore, we did quarantine based on the protocol of six feet or more, well, excuse me, six feet or less, left, right, front, back, com compared to that positive case, as opposed to everybody getting quarantined. So it's more like a scalpel, as opposed to, I don't know, a machete. Can I ask a question? BOCES doesn't have barriers, uh, absolutely not, and they require testing in order to get back in the building. I don't know if they changed it, we don't. And I know that because our BOCES students were out longer because they were waiting for tests. I just have a question. I thought 
from the guidance that we were given um, through the attorneys and also from what I've read of New York State's reopening plan, that the definition of social distancing was six feet or a barrier. Are we not following that? So even the CDC, they say a close contact definition is 15 minutes, six feet or less for a 24 hour period of time. Nassau County didn't take that language. They said, so six, they Nassau, said 15 consecutive minutes. They didn't take the CDC new terminology for direct contacts of 15 minutes over 24 hour period. So are you saying that Nassau County has not adopted the rule that a barrier is social distanced? Correct. They take that into effect, but they, they don't, they still at this time are making us quarantine. If it's a trifold barrier and at least six feet, we're erring on the side of caution of going to the direct person next to them, either on the left or the right side or both, so depending on where the child is sitting, and front and back of that person. It may change in a month. It may change in a week, but as of now, that's the protocol that they tell us to use. So Nassau County is the, is the guidance that is saying go three this way, three that way, one in front and one behind? For elementary schools, because they're less than six feet. But there's a barrier and they're wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. But they're, sometimes they're young. They're not always adherent to the mask as opposed to the secondary level. So they err on the side of caution. And we have had 4% in school transmission, so I don't feel comfortable and I hope you don't feel comfortable loosening those protocol guidelines at that time. If we see a difference in, in objective data over time, then we can discuss again with Nassau County. But right now, they're okay with the protocols and we're okay with those protocols. The, the other um, thing that I've observed over these many months is mm -hmm. when Ms. Algerio Bento is doing her interviews, she asks questions about the children themselves. She had mentioned mass compliance earlier. She also talks to me about does this child get up and down and out of his seat? Does he need more help from an individual? Does a paraprofessional come over and talk to them for lengths of time? There's a, there's a series of questions, so much so that it's almost difficult for someone else to do the interview because she's you know, very intuitive in terms of what she asks. One question leads to the other. And sometimes that changes an outcome, isn't that true? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the high school level and the middle school level, when we implement the barriers that we've purchased, that's not going to be considered socially distant? Until we have enough cases to see, we're going to continue doing the quarantine that we have presently. Again, it's a free-flowing conversation, so each case is decided upon various variables and factors. If we've had no entrance in school transmission once we do the trifold barriers, then we, we may be quarantining less. I don't know yet. We, we haven't gone to that stage yet. But I is that a comment. decision that's being made by Nassau County? Because there's Sacred Heart has barriers, mm -hmm. and the, that's considered social distancing. They're Nassau County too. And there are some schools that don't use face masks and just use the trifold barriers. Every school is, is operating differently. But if we're all operating under the same set of circumstances that are put upon us by the Nassau County Department of Health, and we're all in Nassau County, how is that possible? Because we, they're erring on the side of caution and we're in agreement with it. We've had school in school transmission rates. So even though there's 325 cases and 13 cases were in school transmission, we still don't feel like it's, it's a safe number to lessen the quarantine. By we, do you mean we Rockville Center or we Nassau County Department no, of Health? No, meaning myself as well as Nassau County. I've had dialogue up until yesterday with them asking, do we need to adjust the quarantine protocols? And they said, we'll continue to have the conversation based on each case. Terry, you talked a lot about outside activity. So I know some parents want to know to what level do you and the school nurses get involved in contact tracing outside of school? So now the kids are back to sports. We have our own sports here and we have sports other places, you know, clubs and things outside of mm -hmm. us are opening. So can you just give us an example of what happens when something happens outside of school? Not, so it's sports or it's a gathering somewhere outside of the district. How much involved do you get, or how much is the Department of Health involved in that, and do they come, <clears throat> come together? Because I think people that have been quarantined from outside activities, then some of them are getting contacted from the Department of Health, some aren't, and that's outside of us, but I am curious as to what role you play in things that are happening outside. So if it's a sports-related event, sometimes the Department of Health knows before me, and then sometimes I know before them. They then give guidance on whether or not we need to quarantine the entire team, and then they just tell me who the Rockville Center students are. 
and then we quarantine based on that knowledge. I'll give you an example. Recently, we had um, some players on our basketball and wrestling teams confronted with positive cases of opposing teams. Based on the dialogue, based on our protocols, based on our videoing, we were able to have a dialogue as opposed to other schools that closed the program down. I was able to keep it open and we were able just to isolate those players that played 15 minutes or more during the game. So it's a constant dialogue. However, social gatherings, again, it's based on the cooperation and partnership of parents and the nurses to let us know who was at that social event. If a child was positive, they tell us the positive and then we ask, were they direct contacts? It's part of the interview process. So if they do become transparent and tell us the names, then we do quarantine them because we don't want them to come into school and spread transmission. If there's no transparency, I can't contact Trace. So whenever we do an interview, we always ask, who did you socialize before school? Who did you socialize after school? Did you participate in a dance program or a sport program? It goes a full gamut of questions. Did you even get tutored by someone? You know, we're, we try to do our due diligence. Bus drivers, did you sit behind the bus driver as opposed to two rows away? So we really try to really cover everyone because we're, we're here to educate and, and keep everyone as safe as possible. So right, we so do the, quarantine. So the answer is our staff is working on even contact tracing things that are happening outside of us to yes. try to then preclude those students from coming back into our building. So that's a yeoman's task, I'm sure. Yes, it is. To find out information. So as we now put more people together, I think that that, that partnership you're talking about becomes even more important. If we want to get these dates solidified, we want March 8th to come. We want March 15th and March 22nd to come, but without good information. And I know we're just coming off of a travel period as well. Mm -hmm. We just want to remind parents, you know, the screening's really important, the honesty is important, the travel quarantine. We mentioned this on the live stream yesterday. Mm -hmm. We did seemingly better this February break than we had in breaks past. Um, that was a factor in, in you know, determining and solidifying our dates, and that was positive. <clears throat> but we hope that that's because we're getting really good information. We said this yesterday of just trying to remind people to get in that habit of reporting. Um, as we put more people together, it just becomes even more crucial, and we want this to be successful. So um, it's good to know how much you're doing uh, you know, with people on the outside, because I think um, it does impact how we are able to function as a school district. So thank you for doing that. Um, Other questions from the board? Kelly? Yeah, just going back to the three and three at the elementary level mm -hmm. and moving forward as we look to bring everyone back at the secondary level, is another variable the square footage of the particular classroom, if it is, or the lunch space, wherever we think you know the student was? Does that factor into the decision as well in terms of the contact tracing? Yes, because our is. elementary buildings, as we know, even within the same building, the physical spaces and, and the square footage from classroom to classroom can vary as well as the class size. So if it's a smaller class and a larger classroom, they might be spread out. Absolutely, we always report. When we did our contact tracing online so I have access to all the buildings, the building principals put the square footage of each room. So that's, again, one of the variables that we discussed with the Department of Health. Um, also, we, if there is more than one case, we close the classroom down, and that's recommendation from Nassau County Department of Health. So even though the child may not sit near each other and be a direct contact initially, if during that 10-day period of time another case has become positive in that classroom, we err on the side of caution and in agreement with Nassau County, we close that classroom down, and we have done that on one or two occasions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there a website or a, um, a document that we could point the public to that has these rules from Nassau County that seem to be different from the rules from New York State and the New York State guidance that's out there? It's not rules. It's based on dialogue and variables that are each case by case based. But the rule of that a barrier it does not meet the socially distant category, which seemed to be at odds with what we were told originally, where is that? Because I don't see that anywhere. I've gone through the NASA County website. I've gone through um, the New York State Department of Health website, and I'm not finding any definition different than social distancing equals six feet or a barrier and that if you can't social distance, you must wear a mask in places like an elevator and a hallway.
to mitigate and the time frame that you've explained is there right so even i think people are really confused and i'm kind of confused about where this guidance is coming from that we're so it's based on objective data that we have in the school so there's been in school transmission and children were six feet and there was positive cases so based on that again after objective data is looked at with the trifold barriers we don't have any data collection right now we will have dialogue at the secondary level with Department of Health if we start seeing more and more cases becoming positive and there's no tr in school transmission. Well, we have data on the trifold barriers for the grammar schools, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. And the grammar schools are where we're more concerned that they're less mass compliant. So and they're, they're it going would to probably get a secondary, be secondary better level at the secondary people. level, right? Than, than what we've experienced at the grammar school level? Well, yes and no. I see a lot of kids, I constantly remind them when I walk through the halls to pick up their mask. They keep it right under their nose. So even though they're older, no one likes to wear a mask. Plus, when we, when we purchased the barriers back in, you know, before September mm -hmm. started, especially for the elementary, to be able to get them all in, part of the thinking was we knew these kids were going to have to eat at their desks. Correct. It was an extra layer of protection. And we knew in the elementary schools to get them back with the amount of space we actually had available to us, the barriers were that way to, to, the way to do it. Correct. So going hybrid, but keeping them six feet apart, we talked about the barriers for the secondary ed in the beginning. Mm -hmm. We decided not to go that route because we were concerned. Now we're going that route. So we were talking a little bit about this yesterday also, that the barriers provide that extra layer of protection, but not necessarily going to cut down contact tracing and quarantining once we all go back together. So as these surveys are coming into the principals and we're finding out the actual numbers of kids returning, because we do have many remote children and some who may choose the remote option over the full-time option if that's their only two choices now. Um, it's going, you know, we have to prepare parents that barriers are layers of protection but will not preclude them from being quarantined or from being contact traced. If, that, right. if, we, if we give the impression the barriers prohibit their kids from being set into a quarantine, we're setting the wrong, we're setting the wrong precedent, right? Absolutely. It's like staff accommodations. Um, if you're pregnant, you don't automatically become, God forbid, mortality rates higher from COVID. It just means you're at, you're at an increased risk. So the same thing with the trifold barriers. It's not the 100% safety right. point. It reduces the spread of aerosol right. generating particles, but it's not 100%. So again, we're gonna err on the side of caution until we have enough objective data to feel comfortable that they're effective for us. But, but I think what you just stated, President Hackett, with all due respect, is incorrect. Because at the grammar school level, the purchase of the barriers was not an extra measure, it was the measure, because we couldn't keep them six feet apart and bring them all back. So the I, I, I already said that we needed those barriers to get the kids all back well, you said at the space. They have to take but I said barriers give an eat. extra layer of protection because they were going to be eating in the classroom. But that's not why we did it. We did it because to we be able to get them all back. Feet. Right, the exactly. Barriers were there, so we so we could get them all feet. back. Right, not that's as what an I said. extra layer because they had to take their mask off. I'm, I'm saying in general, barriers are an extra layer of protection, and I think parents are concerned when we're putting more people together, I don't want to give the impression that the barrier is going to prohibit their children from being chosen in a quarantine. It's not the, it's not the thing that's, it's an extra layer of protection of catching the virus, but not necessarily an extra measure It's going to make sure their child does not get picked up in a quarantine. I think a lot of people are concerned that more kids means more contact tracing, more quarantine. So I just want to be clear, the barrier maybe protect them better from COVID, but not necessarily make them not be picked up in the quarantine. That's what I'm trying to separate here. And yes, it is the reason we're able to go back because of space, but I just want to set a clear expectation. And remember it's going to be also, new. at the secondary level, the students are moving around. At the elementary level, they're sedentary. Right. So that's also another level of exposure risk. So there's a lot of variables that we have to see how they play out. Right. No, we're not opening questions to the public. Um, right now, I'm sorry. We're going to take any questions from board members for I Ms. Algeria Mento. I just wanted to follow up on something, something that actually came to us, I think, via an email. Um, can you talk about someone um, who their child was quarantined for 10 days, and then somewhere within that, they were re-quarantined, how that happens? So if they can't isolate for various reasons, either space, 
functionality. It's a young child that's three years old and the mom is positive and the husband is out as, as a worker and she's the primary caregiver. There's no way for that mom to isolate from the three-year-old for safety reasons, for hazards of health reasons. They, she needs to nurture that child. So every day for 10 days when you're positive, they say you have the ability to shed the virus at an infectious component, meaning your virulent load is where you can infect someone. After 10 days, you may continue to test positive, but it's a nominal amount of a viral load that is not a health risk of exposing additional people. So every day you come in contact with an infected person in your household, you restart your quarantine clock. So you become a direct contact all over again. So it's kind of like every day you start at day one. So in, in actuality, you're quarantining 10 days, but in actuality, you're quarantining 20 because every day you're exposed to a 10 day infectious person and your quarantine gets reset. So that's the reason why. Okay. Um, and then I just, I think this is more of a question for next week, but I just wanted, since we were talking about six feet and three feet and how far and, and barriers, um, I know some districts who are bringing everybody back are saying if there's any, any cases in a classroom, they'll shut the classroom down because they're, they're putting so many more students in a classroom. Are, are we going that way or are we gonna still try to contact trace and just work around? Again, I don't, I don't quarantine haphazardly. I quarantine very meticulously. I feel like I, I quarantine with a scalpel, as I said earlier. Um, you know, I like to keep the buildings open. That's my pride and joy. I believe children need to function socially and educationally in these buildings. I think it's very important for mental health as well as academic success. So I will not close a classroom down I will fight vehemently not to close the classroom down unless I'm told I have to by the Department of Health. Again, it's a free-flowing dialogue. Okay. I just had a, a, a comment that maybe you could respond to about the EasyScan app. The EasyScreen app? Yeah. The, so when you answer the question that you've been traveling, and we just came up with this um, today, I, I personally experienced it. If, if you've been traveling and you click the button, there's no way to answer the questions further. You get a negative response that you're not allowed to come back to school. I knew better and understood that I had already made my decisions and had my information correct. But if you're a parent and you're out there and you're hitting that and you're waiting in the comments section to put in, I did my three-day test, I came back, I quarantined for three days, I took my test, there's no option for that. No, it is. When you click on something, it, it comes up a box, either yellow or green, and you can add comments. I but did, but it doesn't change your designation. No, no, absolutely not. That's for the nurse to reverse it. So okay. they look at, they, they call, they see who's yellow, they call, they have a dialogue, they find out if you've had the two negative tests or not. Okay, so that's how that works. If you that's got the negative, if you got a check mark that was yellow, I think mm -hmm. the color is, then you will get a call from the nurse and you can explain your situation. You don't have to just keep your kid home. Correct, or a lot of times the parents already reach out ahead of time to say we're going to Bermuda or we're going to St. John or we're going to Florida. So they've had very good communication with the nurses. Okay, thank you. I also wanted to thank you very much for your work in getting the vaccines from South Nassau Hospital and to thank the leadership there for making sure that we have our staff vaccinated. And I did wanna say, as I said two weeks ago, um, that I understand that so many people in the district are doing jobs that they were never intended to do. And most of them are sitting over there, including yourself and all your nursing staff. So I recognize what a Herculean task it is. My points in making the points I made last week about analyzing and contact tracing is simply because I've watched it in my home with my husband's job and how important it is to continue to analyze and look at the data so that we can keep the doors open. Because the most important thing is not only to get the kids back, but to keep them open and not have a situation like Mrs. Dion just suggested could be possible where the doors are shutting the minute we open them. We want the kids back in the building. And I thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank it, you very much. It wasn't ever meant as a criticism to say we need to analyze and we need to look. As a board member, my vision and the lens I'm looking at it through is to say, how can we help you? Clearly, every time someone says something, the answer is, we'll call Tara or do this. What support can, can we provide in order to make this effort a group effort that we keep these doors open? You know, it, it's, I, it, I don't want it to seem like I'm, I'm boistering my, my own reputation, but we, we are fortunate as a school district to have a nurse practitioner. 
Many con districts are doing contact tracing administrative wise, and they don't have the medical facilities and the, or, or in depth decision making. So a lot of times they panic and close schools and we're not doing that. So I think we're handling it as best as we can. We have extra sub nurses that Mr. Chang and Dr. Leahy have arranged for, for us to have for more contact tracing purposes, weekend help. The administrative team has been amazing from Dr. Leahy down to every single assistant principal and principal. They're willing to get their, their elbows deep in, in what I'm doing. They're assisting, they're looking for dialogue to help me. There's only so much anybody can do because at the end of the day, I'm the only medical district professional. So unless you get a someone else like me, I don't think that the workload is going to be able to come down. I'm also responsible for the largest building in the district. I'm you know, the head nurse at the high school. I don't know. I don't know, maybe hire another nurse full time and they can take over the responsibilities of the high school. I don't know what the answer is. Any other questions from board members? Uh, I would just, I'd just say again, I would love us to produce something that's clearer and easier for our staff and our families to understand the procedure. And I know that you've talked about the frequently asked questions and all that, but it's still, it's evident from the concerns we hear from the public that they just don't understand and can't comprehend where it's all coming from. So don't know the answer. Well, I'll edit my algorithms that I originally had in the district medical plan in the summertime that was a step-by-step -step chart. I could always edit them and hand them out. We can discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I know Mr. Chang said it the last time, but we fully recognize all the work that you and your team are doing is why we've stayed open. We've Thank had you. some cases where I know it pained you to have to close buildings. I know it. And even for classes or grades, we've had to do it. And it's, it's a shame it happened. And we're happy that we were able to open and reopen again and have more kids come back. And we really know that that's largely, if not all in part, due to the hard work of you and your staff. So thank you very much. And I know you're joining us again. So you'll be um, open to public questions at our forum, which is a week from today. So we'll um, kind of run through maybe some more specifics about the reopening plans in conjunction with the principals and how some of those things are going to work. I know um, from past meetings we started talking about lunch periods and hallways and we'll save some of that over when we're all together and really talking specifically about reopening. Um, but we really do appreciate you joining us tonight and you're welcome anytime. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you. Sarah, thank can you. I ask one more thing? Sure. Is, can we get a copy of the numbers you, you talked about tonight? Absolutely. I can leave them behind with Mr. Chang and he can make copies for you. Thank you very much. She's giving me paper. <laughs> oh, he hates paper. <laughs> Mr. Chang, did you want to give an update um, to the community on our current numbers? I know we were starting to do that at board meetings um, where get an update on how many students are currently remote or quarantined right now. Um, before we do that, just in terms of it, it, I got to open up the file. It's taking a little bit of time to open up. So I just want to introduce uh, this is Sonia Hood, who's just going to give us an update in terms of curriculum and uh, the additional information that we're going to be pumping out about the things that we do as a school district. Um, and I'd also like to introduce, you know, our central district um, director of curriculum and instruction to give us a little uh, presentation on that. Uh, and I'll bring up the numbers. Good evening, everyone, uh, working with this mask. Do I sound garbled or I'm okay? Give me a thumbs up. All right, good. Um, good evening. This is the first time I'm interacting and engaging with you on this forum. So I'd like to officially introduce myself. My name is Sonia Hood, and I am the Director of Curriculum and Instruction of Rockville Center School District. Um, I am pleased to be here. Um, it's never really easy, I guess, being the new person on the block, the new kid on the block, but um, I have to really just want to extend a heartfelt thank you. I have been welcomed with open arms, um, so I definitely would like to thank the board, uh, President Hackett, trustees of the board, Superintendent Chang, 
and the phenomenal administrative cabinet for welcoming me with open arms, um, particularly Dr. Sampino, who took time out of her busy schedule those first few weeks that I was here and took me to every school building as I uh, got a grand tour from all the principals. Um, Mr. John Murphy is here. I thank you all as well. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited. I am happy to be able to present the update on curriculum and instruction because I feel that that's really where our focus should be. And although there have been uh, many challenges that COVID presented to us, I feel confident after being through all the buildings and seeing instruction firsthand that um, we still are staying true to our mission to educating our youth, to providing rigorous and challenging instruction. And um, I'm just pleased about that, really, truly pleased. There's so many things that are changing, but this is constant. And um, without further ado, I will uh, try to present this in the sake of time as concise and efficient as possible, but I want it to be comprehensive as well. Um, I hope you can see, I know the curtains are not fully open, but I think you can see a good amount. Let's see. And also, just to put a disclaimer here, um, I know that the high school is the image that is shown. It's a beautiful building. I don't want any other school to feel slighted, but in terms of, I know when I see Rockville Center School District, even online, it's always the high school that is the indicator of the, of the district. So that is not to slight any other school in the district, and um, I'm sure that this is my first time, but won't be my last time presenting, and we'll alternate between <laughs> school images of, of various schools. Okay, let's see. Oh, it turned, oh, okay. or maybe, because we're all in the same direction. Okay, so uh, what I plan to do is give the, uh, first slide will be just an overview of the instructional plan, and then the subsequent slide will be the updates and enhancements. And this is basically from the beginning of, of the year. I've been in the district now for approximately five to um, six weeks. And um, this is the overview and update with, within that time. So this shows the alignment. All of the elementary schools pretty much um, have these components in place. There is student-centered instruction, um, block scheduling for mathematics and ELA, which provides additional time to allocate toward instruction, it provides additional time for teaching and learning. Small guided groups in uh, all in math and English language arts. There's um, a social emotional learning component, which is very, very key, especially particularly during these times where you have lessons, teachers that are providing lessons and providing students with safe space so that they can discuss decision making, making good choices, discussing how they feel, if they have um, any issues or any concerns. There's a, a, a safe space for them to have those discussions. And particularly in grades K through five, each student is met with individually. Each student is met with individually. Then there's whole group instruction uh, uh, few, like two to three times, uh, several times during the week. So they're getting uh, lessons of how to manage their emotions, how to identify emotions, how to manage them, how to discuss them, and how to build strong, positive uh, relationships. There is a FLESS program. So I think I, someone mentioned about if there has been changes to the curriculum. There has not been changes to the curriculum. The modality and the mode of delivery may have changed, but the um, curriculum and instruction is steadfast, um, continues to be rigorous, and to meet the diversified needs of all learners. I'm excited about that. There also is academic, AIS, academic intervention support for learners who are struggling. Um, remote learning may not be the easiest, and students may find it challenging. So there is live support available for them. Um, on a daily basis so that they can connect to the learning um, more effectively. And these are 
between January and, and February, we have you know, a few holidays that are highlighted. Um, we are in the midst of celebrating Black History Month, so there have been celebrations at all schools. At all schools, um, they have celebrated through virtual assemblies, and I have some images on, on the following slides. Virtual assemblies, and the framework for Black History Month is not only recognizing the accomplishments of notable African Americans, but we took uh, the lens of diversity. So some of the assemblies highlighted the Holocaust, which um, the elementary schools had a um, Holocaust survivor come and present, facilitate discussions. Uh, it was called, it was entitled Conversations uh, with Anne, which highlighted the uh, captivity of Anne Frank, who was a um, uh, Holocaust, Holocaust victim. And uh, she chronicled her captivity through a journal, so it became more of a uh, way to enhance what they are already learning about, a history lessons, and what a powerful way to have a first-hand account of uh, someone who, who is a Holocaust survivor. Um, we talk about in social studies, particularly primary sources of information, and you don't always get a primary source of information. You know, if you, uh, you learn about George Washington, but you won't have him in front of you to share some of his experiences. Um, also, during Black History Month, the uh, students had a virtual assembly with a straight descendant of a Civil War soldier and a former slave. She came and she facilitated discussions um, around recollections of, of stories based on her experiences. So um, real life connections to the learning, um, which is still going on in the midst of a pandemic, powerful stuff. Literacy week, uh, were a week filled of activities, um, a pajama party, there uh, were poster contests, uh, writing contests, um, bookmark making, it was um, appropriate based on grade level, what, what students could handle at the particular time, but rich activities to foster a love of reading, writing, and learning. Um, virtual presentations, there were uh, students who provided uh, pr virtual presentations, research mini presentations and author studies. There's an author coming in uh, next month, um, and uh, classes will be doing uh, author studies. And these are some of the themes, some of the images. So the top image is a student who, were, uh, for Valentine's Day, they made Valentine's Day cards. It was uh, entitled Valentine's for Veterans. <laughs> and uh, the top picture is her looking at the board and reading and writing the sentences. And basically, this turned into a lesson also, where it's building literacy where she was uh, building vocabulary, writing uh, the cards, reading the cards. So a celebration basically was integrated into um, a lesson as well. Um, conversations with Anne, and that's on the far left. Just, just the images. For Black History Month, instead of just learning about a historical figure or a notable figure, they took quotes. They analyzed the quotes, they wrote about how it was applicable to the notable person, how it was reflected in their life. So just rich experiences. And on the end here, that is um, food, a Super Bowl food drive. So we all equate the Super Bowl with a festive time. We may invite people over, have food and, and fun, and our students, said, you know what, there may be some people who do not have food, who may not have the opportunity to enjoy the Super Bowl traditionally like, like we normally would have. So what an altruistic thing to do. So they um, did a, a food drive and uh, supported local uh, families in the community, went to charitable different organizations. And this is all basically within the month this month of February. Continuing the monthly themes and celebrations, um, the monthly themes are 
embedded directly into units of instruction that are already occurring in the curriculum. Uh, once again, Valentine's for Veterans, Achievements of African Americans. Up top is Principal uh, Mr. Duffy, and that is their bulletin board with a lot of notable figures. And as they studied those figures, learned about them, they posted them on their bulletin board. Once again, more themes and celebrations. Um, I don't want to point out each one because you know you can visually see them, but one thing that I do want to point out is the timeline and sequence. Now that, I believe that's a second grader. And what that second grader is doing, powerful, powerful. So they're creating a timeline of Harriet Tubman. So if you see, you may not see, I, I, I was able to see it uh, closely, but he's numbering and sequencing the order of events. We call that sequencing. So basically that is tying in, it's called interdisciplinary. It's tying in math and English language arts. And really that's the type of learning we, want, we would like to hone in on, where it doesn't appear that the learning is segmented, but it's connected. They're getting an understanding of those concepts and skill, and by the time he's in fifth or sixth grade, he's probably gonna be dynamic in mathematics, abstract thinking, but it starts out like this. Um, so this is an interdisciplinary approach to instruction, which is wonderful, because like I mentioned, it's not segmented. The learning occurs on a continuum, so we shouldn't look separately at math and English language arts. It's, an, it's a natural progression to make a connection between English language arts and social studies and math and science. But if we're starting out like this in second grade and continuing on that continuum, you know, I believe that he's gonna be probably great in all subjects if he has that understanding that the learning is not segmented. So timeline and sequencing there, um, I really like that image there, and I, that's why I included it in this presentation. Um, secondary instruction overview. Um, we still have, uh, we still are implementing NYP and DP in the midst of the pandemic, and it's a framework of best practices, inquiry-based instruction, where students are looked at as independent thinkers, and it's a, a process of learning how to learn, right? We don't want students to regurgitate just what a teacher is saying. We want them to be able to formulate theories and um, test out those theories and through the preponderance of evidence like a, science, uh, a scientist or a researcher, then come up with um, an answer, problem solving, and that has been evident through um, Dr. Sampino and, and, and myself, our tours through the building, going directly in the classroom, we see this inquiry-based instruction. Um, they are providing SEL, social emotional support, as well for our students. There's a zero period advisory period that is available for all students, remote and in-person. They are supplied with a link and they are able to get that support. They log in if they're having difficulty or trouble um, they are able to get that support. School counselors have Google Classrooms for each grade, and they um, provide another layer of support. Um, and there is support available for all subjects, as I mentioned, for in-person students and remote students. Bridges to Excellence, um, alignment with the middle school and the high school. Application of concepts and skills to project-based learning, a big component of the um, NYP and DP framework is community service and service learning, uh, which are very similar, but the service learning component um, ties into the knowledge that is acquired and the concepts that the students are learning in class, and then use that knowledge to apply to um, outside of the classroom. And although that may not be applicable to our current circumstances, they are still doing it through um, asynchronous instruction. Um, an example of that, I have it on a, <coughs> a subsequent slide, that there was an event, no dog left behind, and um, our photographer and videographer, uh, Mr. Matt Cobb, I have to give him thanks also for these images, 
um, highlighted that on social media. So that is a social learn, um, a service learning piece that is being done in the midst of a pandemic in a different way, but it's still being done. So with the No Dog Left Behind campaign, what that entailed was over 100 dogs that were um, brought from out of the country, they were adopted in the states. Two teachers headed um, that particular project up, I believe, uh, I want to give them credit, Miss uh, Abruzzo and Miss Miller. And the students saw that as an opportunity to take action. So what they did was they um, did fundraising and they created dog toys and homemade baked treats. And they brought attention to um, animal cruelty, ways to eradicate animal cruelty. So that is what service learning is all about. It may not be done in the traditional format, but it is still being done um, at the high school and middle school. Um, the goal to build autonomous learners, and then these are monthly themes that are um, celebrated, or that have been celebrated within the past uh, six weeks. And um, I really could have added a whole lot more. I had to find a, a stopping point. But uh, the theme for kindness, the high school is actually um, pairing up, partnering up with the Center for Racial Justice and Equity in Education to um, host a few workshops. Um, there was Acceptance Day, an anti-bullying campaign. Um, Don't Press Send was another assembly which spoke about um, virtual etiquette, online etiquette. Um, and there's celebration of monthly learner profile traits. And um, some of you probably are already aware with the terminology. But they have various traits that are exemplary of an IB learner or, uh, or a learner, uh, a learner. And it um, entails being reflective, being caring, being a communicator. So it, it impresses upon us that we want not only competent students, but we want students who are civic-minded, who are compassionate, good, decent citizens. Um, author study, and there also is uh, LPP, stands for Liberty um, Partnership Program, where mentor, mentorship is available, one-to-one -one mentorship is available for our students. A lot of good stuff going on in Rockville Center. And these are um, images. Uh, celebrations, assemblies. Another piece, these two images, which I really love, the, the student with the Rubik's Cube and the student that is facing toward the window, those images were taken in school. Um, another way of um, integrating content areas, subject areas, inter interdisciplinary instruction. So this was an art lesson, and what they did was they they took these self-portraits. What they did was created stories to these images. They spoke about um, imagery, um, literary devices, and uh, just blended subject areas, which is powerful, powerful, powerful instruction. And we, we really want to continue that and push that and encourage that. So the next steps, um, although this was the first presentation, it won't be the last, and how we will continue to keep communication going and keep you updated um, along the lines of the mission of Superintendent Chang to be transparent and have open communication and to tell our story. We will launch um, the, a newsletter, a district newsletter. The newsletter will be published with three editions. There'll be one for the fall, one for the winter, and one for the spring. And pretty much it will encompass all of what you just uh, viewed here and heard here, initiatives, projects, um, all things curriculum and instruction. And um, you definitely can send an email to uh, myself or Dr. Sampino if there's anything extra that you would want to see in the newsletter, information that you feel, wow, this may be something that would be great to include please uh, feel free to contact us. I would like to share real quick. I don't know if I can do this. I may have to get uh, Robert, my male Vanna White, <laughs> to uh, click into that too. Can we, will it go in? Not down. I think I'll press control click. Just to give a quick view, overview of some of the. Not down. Does it come up? Yeah. 
some other um, items. So I thank you for your time. I hope I wasn't too long-winded. No, thank you. Don't, don't, don't go yet. <laughs> thank don't, you very much. Oh, leave. are there yeah, any questions? Yes, or? I have a question for you, but first of all, thank you, because it's great to highlight what the kids are doing. Yeah. We spend so much time this year talking about COVID, and this is why we're here, and it looks like we're really keeping up with really important lessons, so thank you for giving us an overview. Um, you touched on something, and I'm just curious, especially as we're starting to bring more people back, is there any thought process to um, plans for in-person extra help as we start adding kids back to buildings? And again, anybody can jump in. I don't mean to just put Ms. Hood on the spot, but I know it's a question parents have asked us. Um, and as we start to get more in person, will that be available to students? Well, I would assume so. Right now we are continuing with AIS and that will still be available because there hasn't really been any changes to the, to the curriculum. Right. So the same supports that were available will continue to be available. And I'm sure there may be even more once all the students come back and you know, we evaluate the data and see what's needed, where the gaps are, and, um, and it will be provided. And Dr. Sampino may Is be able on? to add. Are you green, Janine, on top? It's green, do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, just to add, so that's at the elementary level. The secondary level, we're still a work in progress. Okay. And we will be. And we are, that's why we have a slow rollout, so we could address the obstacles and how we could address the amount of children in the, in the building at the time. So uh, we don't want to promise anything at this point, right. but we are excited that the kids are coming back. Right. And there's a lot of planning that's going involved in it, so I just wanted to kind of... So we can get an update on that as the, these plans firm up. And plans are firming up seriously every day. Um, you, know, we're, we're, you know, today we met with um, Dr. Zuar and Ms. Rosetto, and you know, there's a lot of factors that go into planning for this. So hopefully we have more answers next week at the forum. But um, as far as elementary, yes, they're, they're in person full time, but as far as the extra support now, I know the middle school is working more that way, but we have a lot of things that we have to work out at the high school level in terms of just even space, um, time. Yeah, I was, I was concerned about space because yes. with extra help, you never know who's going to show up, right? So if there's a process at least to either have to sign up or then I'm also thinking in terms of contact tracing, you know, making sure that we had talked about this on the live stream yesterday that we, we were assuring people that bringing more people in the buildings would still have assigned seating right in their classes. Mm -hmm. So that would make this easier. So I, when I'm thinking about extra help and things where people show up, mm -hmm. it's kind of that secondary thought of let's make sure we know who's, who's there, where they're sitting, um, you know, how many people are we able to accommodate. But these are, I know these are lots the of layers. You guys are working on. <laughs> lots of right. layers. I, you know, if it, there's a way to work out opportunities absolutely. for people to meet teachers in person, I for think, help, I think that would be great. As we move forward, and especially once the kids are there, and we see, like, it, it's, it's hard to plan for, we're, every day I think we have a new conversation about different things. Mm -hmm. And we're figuring out different solutions to different obstacles that we see. So I think it's, it's an exciting time. It, it feels good to plan for it, though. And I just want to thank Sonia. Um, she, we did go to every single building, and we, our principals opened their arms, and our teachers opened their doors, and kids were waving, and, and it was really great to see. Mm -hmm. But what was really special was after we came back from each building, Sonia, I, I think sometimes we take it for granted, like just the wonderful things happening. So it was great to hear someone else's perspective to talk about, just to see the learning, the um, excitement, the openness uh, of our staff and the kids and the principals. It was really wonderful. So even she was inspired then to do the newsletter, which I love, and it will really highlight some of the things um, that are happening in the district. What I also love is we see things that are not just technology related. You see the writing of the cards to the veterans. You see the assemblies. You see kids talking. And I think that's really important now, just trying to get them to talk, communicate, and live in this crazy time. So I thank you, Ms. Hood, and I thank you all for watching. And look for her newsletters. We'll look for our newsletters. It's really exciting from our office to just share with you some of the great things happening in the buildings. Any other board members have curriculum questions? I, I was in, I'm sorry, do you want to go? I, I was happened to be in two of our elementary schools, and I noticed that the Stella rooms are kind of 
shut down, not being used. And I know, I understand that we're not moving around our children. Are we still pu pushing in enrichment programs into our individual classrooms and trying to keep that going as, as best we can in the circumstance? Yeah. Yes. Yes. The Stella teachers are still pushing in. They're coming in, I believe, three times um, out of the week to provide um, enrichment and to support the curriculum that is in place. So yes, it is still occurring. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Just wanted to echo the thank you. And your energy is infectious. And thank you for being so positive and upbeat and highlighting all the great things that are going on. And our elementary buildings, we've always said, have individual personalities and identities, cultural identities of, of themselves, but you did a nice job of showing the core values and how we link that all together, moving up through the secondary level as well, system-wide. So thank you so much. Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you. I, I know you visited all the buildings and I think that's important, that connection that you have when you go inside and you see everyone. And mm -hmm. I've heard from the principals too that you were there and it's, I think it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, they said it already, thank you. But I do have one question that has been asked to us. Um, AIS, have we, how are we identifying our students and have we seen an increase in students that need AIS at this point? Well, I, I believe, you want me to, I just yeah, so, that. sorry, I didn't mean to throw you under No, that's button. okay. <laughs> We're still using multiple, multiple measures of assessment mm -hmm. and that includes um, formal and informal assessments. Mm -hmm. We both, we do, um, our NWA is formative, so that informs our instruction, that's one. We use that as our universal screener three times a year. As well as different points, classroom work, we use, um, for reading, we use Rigby benchmark assessments or Fontas and Pinnell benchmark assessments. For math, we have unit tests. Um, we also have quizzes, as well as homework and observation of students. So, yes, we are still assessing, we are still Going through curriculum, I will tell you, we chunked math based on um, a fall to December timeline, based on conversations of where the students left off. We felt that was really important. We just didn't want to plow through. We really wanted to chunk it so we had the kids, these are, these are foundational math skills, so it was really important for us. As well as with reading, reading is, you know, it's scaffolds and, and, and you build upon skills. We are working very hard. We are still doing foundational uh, work in reading. We do Wilson Foundations K to two, at two, K to two in, our, in our buildings. And for those students who need extra decoding work, we make sure they get it, we make sure they're getting it. Um, the big thing, writing. You know, kids were on their devices and really getting them writing and having stamina to write we're working on that, and um, that was tough, and we really tried, I was, it's, I was glad to see the writing to the veterans. I'm glad to see the bulletin boards with the writing on it when I go into the buildings, because we really need to get kids writing and getting them into that process and, and brainstorming, and I'm very happy when we are in the buildings and we see beautiful student work on the bulletin boards and displays. So do we have an increase in AIS? Well, yes and no, <laughs> we, yes and no. We always serviced probably more students than we, according to the state guidelines, okay? Um, we, our teachers and our AIS team is very in tune with getting kids to where they need to be. So if we see students struggling at every level, they will get support. But support looks different depending on the student and their needs. So if a student in an upper grade still needs decoding, they will be pulled in a smaller group, which is very difficult now, but it happens. In a larger group, if we're seeing a trend, they might do a half class, half class, they might do an in-class you know, type of lesson where half the class is doing one thing, half the class is doing other. So it really depends on, you know, like as I was talking about writing, we still a trend. We had to go kind of back, like everybody needed instruction in writing because you have to remember, our first graders, for example, miss the second part of the year. So they're coming in as second graders where they were already writing sentences, but they weren't. You know, like they had to kind of go back and reteach how to write a proper sentence, how to write paragraphs. Usually by third grade, they're writing multiple paragraphs, and, and we're getting there now. You know, like we're, you know, we're getting there. But when they came in in the fall, it was very difficult for the teachers because that is, they had to really assess where the students were and are and where they need to be. And I think they're doing a phenomenal job where they see a child struggling, they reach out to the AIS team. So it's a, it's a fluid thing. They might not need AIS 
for the entire year. They might need a little extra support in you know, a, a small group instruction with a little Fontes and Pinnell to work on comprehension, and then they take off. They might need a little, you know, more decoding. It really depends on the child, and it is very fluid. If you are any, if you are concerned at all, and you feel like your child should be getting AIS and they're not, please reach out to the, the teacher, reach out to the building principal. We, I am so proud of the fact that we did not dismantle our AIS. Other districts, they, they, they pulled apart AIS. They put an AIS teacher in a classroom to try to make class sizes smaller, and they were still having issues. We really tried to keep our program together because we knew students would need support. So yes and no. We've always had a larger group number, but we're being very flexible and fluid with it, and it might look different, different places. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. Thank you. And we're constantly looking at our students and their data. We really are. And that goes all the way up through, you know, we really want to make sure that kids are getting the support that they need. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Thank you so much. It was nice to see you, Ms. Hood. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. You too. Madam President, um, before I uh, go on to the next topic here, uh, the quarantine numbers currently uh, as a school district, we're at 127 throughout the district, majority of which are at the high school and the middle school. Well, the higher numbers relative to the numbers that we have. And then the students that are remote are now at 572. 72? 572. Um, and Madam President, if I may, I know we've had a lot of guests and I had an opportunity to walk um, through the high school today with our principal, uh, John Murphy. And um, it's always a pleasure to walk the hallways with, with John. Um, it always seems like we're pacing to another class as quickly as possible to figure out and, and solve whatever issues that he had when he was walking around with the barrier today. Um, actually sitting in, this is one of the greatest things that you could see as a principal, uh, as someone who is a principal, taking the barriers, putting it up, sitting down. I had him come up, sit back down, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, so it was, a, it was a good experience to kind of do that, but that's the type of principal that we have is someone that's engaged and that wants to be hands-on. Um, I do have him here, I know we have him here for our policy uh, conversation, but I also just wanted to give him and yield the floor to him for a few minutes to talk about uh, IB and the information that went out today um, and just give him the floor to be able to give a little bit of color to the, the message that he sent. I just break a rule? How's the chain? Thank you. Um, so I, it's, it's two things, one of which is one that I'm a part of, and I'm going to thank the, the team, the memorial team, not the least of which is uh, Ms. Hackett, Ms. Dion, the input from, from Dr. Leahy, as well as our PPS staff for um, something that is important but was unfortunate that we had to uh, develop it, which was a memorial policy, which um, due to our most recent history is, is becoming a necessity. It's been, it was born out of um, the lack thereof and a series of uncomfortable positions that, in, that very well-intentioned, but well-meaning people have been placed in, um, coupled with the new circumstances, not just in this district, but regionally and nationally with the, the increased um, mental health risk that our adolescents are being put under both, and, and we can deal with those factors externally, but due to the um, increased number of students who we're losing at the, predominantly at the secondary level, but it does happen elsewhere, through suicide and through other means, there's also an increase um, literature and understanding of how we can dignify those lives while also keeping our students safe. And the literature evolves very quickly and very, gra and, and very rapidly over time. The, as I said, the real quandary is wanting to celebrate and dignify and mourn, um, which is part of, uh, of health and wellness, um, but also being mindful of those memorializations and of those celebrations, as well as intentioned as they may be, what we have found recently can actually create what's called a contagion effect um, or a trigger, um, not just for students, but also for staff and faculty members. I've been here a very long time, and I've walked these hallways, I, I can't begin to tell you, 
and magically over the last 36 to 48 months, there are things that I just never noticed before and you start, they start to pop out and they are in, in large part memorials, um, remembrances of, uh, of those who passed. Um, so we are not alone. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this involved research. There are districts throughout the county, the state and the country who are in the process of developing a policy to standardize the process, not to make it more impersonal, but to save people from themselves and to also let the community and the district know that God forbid we ever do have to need it in the future. There are guidelines moving forward and what we can, can't, should and shouldn't do. It will not be a blueprint. The thing that I think I've learned is that as much as you read with this literature, there is very little black and white. Absolutely never do this, absolutely always do this, because each instance is contextualized. That's what made this so difficult, and it took over a year to write. It's only a two-page document. But what I'm, I'm proud of, and I think that we've come together with, is a coming together of what we see as our own history, our own chronology, our past practices, coupled with those policies that have been implemented here, regionally and elsewhere, that seem to have staying power without, for lack of a better word, sterilizing the building. I think you can create such a strict policy that it starts to sound like you can't memorialize a death at all. And that can have an adverse effect. You're actually, you have to give people healthy and, and reasonable ways to grieve and to mourn, especially our kids, and to teach it. You don't closet it, you don't sweep it under the carpet, but you do it in a healthy fashion. So what we came up with um, is a policy um, that was intended not to be a tome, um, to be brief, concise, to provide guidelines without becoming stultifying um, and giving room for what has been s expressed, especially by the American Prevention for Suicide and the Long Island Crisis Center to be healthy ways to students and to treat all deaths, for lack of a better word, the same, whether the student is irrespective of the way that, that, that the student or the staff member loses their life. So I don't know if Ms. Hackett wanted sure. to. Yeah, so you know, we can jump into the policy since we're here, if, you, yeah, if that's gonna, okay I, with I you. I was gonna suggest, um, and then we could give an update. And then we'll go to IBM. IBM. Sorry. That's yeah. fine, because I don't wanna you know, so make we'll, you have to hang around for a later yeah. portion. So what, we're, a, we're on the policy now. Let's, we'll yeah. jump into that. We're on 3170. We had it at stage Sorry. one last meeting. We had just discussion at, we left it at stage one so we could have further discussion with you um, being able to attend. So just again to recap it, where we came out of, out of the place was exactly the point you made. We were gonna treat um, all of the deaths the same way and try to just try to put into terms the allowable and you know avenues that we would not allow memorials to happen. So in the allowable range, we were going with endowments, scholarships, educational programs. Um, and then we have a, a couple of more things that I know um, a couple of board members had questions about, so we'll get into. But that we were trying to stay away from physical um, memorials that were permanent, that would be put on the school grounds in the buildings, but leaving those that were up in, in the, the past. So. Um, John, I know there were some questions and I wanna focus right now on this, the permissible um, activities that we had kind of pinpointed. There were questions at the last meeting about yearbooks, graduation recognition. Um, can, can you talk a little bit to that and, and what um, your staff has kind of suggested or your experience with, with some of those things? Okay, and I'm sorry for going out of no, order. No, it doesn't matter, it's fine. Um, so the year, but so that those are two specifics that if you read the literature, you'll get conflicting views um, on. And the, our policy was based on number one, past practice; number two, not sterilizing the environment too much and providing an appropriate vehicle. The thought process for both of those that seemingly the most the most harmful and dangerous of all of the practices are those that are number one permanent, number two present every single day in a building that the student can't avoid even if they wanted to, um, and, ha and in some way, shape or form either 
celebrates or in some way romanticizes the, the notion of death or passing, not necessarily in those order. The yearbook tribute pages that we've done in the past have been with editorial feedback from our PPS staff, number one. Number two, it's not in the student's face constantly. Number three, at the year that the students graduate, they have a right and a privilege to have their, to be included with their classmates. So the tribute pages historically are a remembrance of the student in a way that every other student is remembered and, and, and fondly in the book. So it's contextualization of that tribute page that has to be done carefully. And again, it was, it was an act of, of outreach to the family and to the kids. Uh, the graduation recognition, similarly, there's a difference between having an empty seat and putting this, you know, that's not what we're talking about. Historically, a student with the, with the fam family's um, permission, um, sometimes they don't want to, or the students, will be mentioned in, for instance, my speech during graduation or a board member's speech. It's to include the person verbally, usually, um, in the context of the graduations, number one, to make sure that they're not forgotten, but number two, in an austere way, that, that's, that's, again, delicate, but also what we found to be within the context of what is healthy and safe. I'm going to open up to questions for board members um, about the policy for Mr. Murphy. I do. Um, I, I, I can understand what you're saying, and I'll just read something in general from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Schools should strive to treat all deaths in the same way, having one approach for memorialization of a student who died of cancer or in a car accident, or, and a different approach for students who just died by suicide reinforces prejudice associated with suicide and may be deeply painful to the students, to the student's family and friends. Now, I, I understand you don't want to sterilize, a, sterilize but in, in reading this and reading other things, I have a lot of information that a student who commits suicide should never, ever have, have um, it says here, do not designate permanent memorials, plaques, pages in the yearbook, or anything at commemoration. Uh, uh, so if you don't want to sterilize the memorial, then I think that you do need to specify even though it goes against this, but you're going, you're, you're looking at it different and best practices say that every death in a school should be treated the same. So you're not being prejudiced as I just read. That's right. So, and I think there's the confound even within the, the context of that, which is from people with far more advanced degrees than I treat every death the same. So don't do this. My counter, my thought process in my head. So if a student passes from a long bout with cancer, and I'm gonna walk up to that family and say, no, I'm not gonna let you put a tribute page in the yearbook, I, I struggle with that. And I, if I'm not gonna do it for that, then how am I also going to do the same thing for student who passes by suicide? So even in the most straightforward of never, never, is complexity, and I, I, I agree I, with you, John. But I truly understand you, and I, I don't know what the right answer is except that if we want to honor someone who went through a battle with cancer, if we want to honor somebody who died horribly in a car accident, we need to set a parameter and not include a student who commits, committed suicide. Everything I've read, everybody I've talked to, they are so sure that that has to happen. Where you get the mixed message from the experts is, do you pass that on and let, let some things be treated different? And some will say you never should, but you, I understand that you want to, and I understand you know, it, it, it's children, and it, it does aid in some form of the, you know, the healing process, but then I really believe in my heart we need to make a policy that says we cannot under whatever umbrella honor or pay, make a tribute to someone who has committed suicide. It's just unhealthy for everybody involved. And the year, uh, you, you can argue the yearbook. The yearbook lives on a shelf for years and it can trigger something 10 years when someone pulls it down and looks at it. So it's a difficult thing, it's hard for me, but everything tells don't 
don't um, recognize a suicide or bring that up, but you know, we can make a policy split in half. I really think that's such an important thing. I think we, we need to do that. It's, it's just so much research says you cannot, um, you know, honor a student. They can re be remembered outside the school system, outside the school district, as everybody knows that it, it happens, but it shouldn't be part of the school system. I, you know, okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I know everybody hesitates. This you can, you can review what I'm saying. I'm just. I know, it, and, and Ms. Murphy, I mean, we spoke, we spoke about this for, oh, uh, some hours. time. Yeah. Um, and Mr. Murphy, you said you struggled with this. So, um, in terms of, because we weren't, there is no memorials. Right, just to be clear, there is no memorials that this allows for mm -hmm. in terms of a physical memorial. But in terms of a yearbook, you, you recommended that we allow this. Because of the continuance of practice, because of the promises that I've made in the past, and because of the editorial delicacy with which we've dealt with it. But I hear Mr. Roche as well. I think the yearbook is a separate issue from the treating all the same. We have to kind of, at the foundation of what we built with the policy was that we were going to treat deaths the same. That's before we get into yearbooks and commemorations and other things. So I think we have to talk about that as a foundation um, because there are so many limited things that are really allowable via this policy. Um, but John, I think what I'm concerned about is if we, if we do that, say we separate it, then that would kind of preclude a family of suicide from creating a scholarship um, or an endowment in somebody's name it, via this policy because this policy is saying those things are allowed and we're treating them all the same. And I don't want to see us not be able to do some of those allowable things. If we're really talking about yearbook, then let's talk about yearbook. But you're raising a, a question or a point that's at the very foundation of the policy that I think we have to come to terms on as a board with input because I, what I don't, like you hear what I'm saying, I don't want to eliminate any men, mention of any student or staff member that had committed suicide via some of those roots of educational programming, um, which really are helpful to students and staff. Um, that would take that off of the table then. Um, scholarships are positive ways to honor people in their name and continue their education and foster a sense of purpose going forward and we would have to take that off the table then. So I'm concerned about changing the base a, of the policy. A, a scholarship isn't necessarily to memorialize, memorialize somebody, but pictures in the yearbook where for years and years people, you know, it could trigger people and suicide is not something that you know, you're triggered when it happens. It could trigger you five, you know, five years later. That 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 emotion. A memorial is a good thing. You're not plastering pictures. You're not bringing that part of the person's life, and you're not. Um, I I don't even know the right words to say. I'm getting. A, but that's okay. I think not, you're worried about putting something in print, maybe. Right? Is that your concern of putting something in yes, print? That's yes. But the pictures and all that. Uh, we I've learned. You know. I've learned so much that the picture is a trigger, but the symbol of, of somebody or foundation is not necessarily a trigger. It could be, but it's not, not, not so. The picture is very hard for people who struggle to, to deal with. So and then again, I think that you're really talking specifically then about some of these particular allowable things versus changing the entire basis of treating all deaths differently or, or the same. I, I'm trying to, I want to get to pinpoint what we might need to make an amendment to. And I'm just concerned about changing that base, like right. I said. Um, well, I, but if the yearbook is something in particular that's troubling you, then I think we should maybe look into that a little bit further. You know, research shows that if it's pictures of research that I read, and there's research that I, I've never even, I, you, know, you know, I'm not an expert. I'm just speaking out of what I've researched, and I've spent two years researching a lot. Um, the pictures of kids, in, uh, the, the child in school, and things like that are much more a trigger than pictures of the child 
the home pictures things like that so the research says it just shouldn't mix but and i understand the want of of a student who does tragically so i if if this is the way the board and the district wants to go i really think we need to i guess you're looking at it it's very harsh but it isn't to not i don't even glorify a suicide you don't want to make anybody feel you know oh if i commit suicide they're going to you know they're going to memorialize me that way and it should never be that it can't be that way i think this is what i was trying to ask last meeting in terms of i think correct me if i'm wrong but president hackett's really referring to more page 1 yes and then when you scroll down to page 2 right and you have them broken out into other permissible memorial activities included and then they're bulleted I, it, the yearbook is number one, and, and I understand everything you're saying, Mr. O'Shea. Is that what this, it, the first page is okay with you, or is it the whole policy? I think that's where I'm confused. Yeah, well, I, you know what, as I brought up last meeting, it, it actually contradicts it, itself because utilizing formal all school or school wide events, including commencement, homecoming, festi festivities, prom, or other thematic, thematic events or weeks to memorialize a deceased st student or staff is prohibited. So you mentioned commencement here, and I know that, Terry you said it was specified a little different here, but I don't think you should make the policy that confusing. I think we can clear it up, but I think just so that we're on the same page, we were separating a name recognition at graduation versus a family or a group of students using graduation as a way to fundraise for a foundation or um, highlight something that has to do with the child, right? Mr. Murphy, that was the conversation we had. That's how we separated commemorative events and not using homecoming or graduations or hopefully when we're back to our regular you know, gatherings, not using those events as a way to further a foundation mission. Yeah. but that name recognition at graduation was a separate, uh, permissible, that's how we tried to separate it. If we have to be more clear, John, I think, th I understand what you're saying, but I just wanna explain again why we wrote it that way. Um, but I think, again, going back to um, Mrs. Barry's comment, we have to kind of come to terms on are we, set, are, are we concerned about, let's talk about the yearbooks, or is it the pictures? Could we do more in terms of you know, working with the staff on that editorial and what that's allowable? You know, as when we had the conversation, it didn't seem like it was pages of tributes that were allowed, but more a family could take out a page and work with the staff on how it was going to be designed, it needed approval. There were systems in place for the yearbook, um, as I understood it when we were on committee, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so is there wiggle room there to talk about things that we would want to appear there versus not appear there? Um, is that where we kind of fix it a little bit? Are you worried more about the photographs versus the name being part of the yearbook? Because if the person was supposed to have graduated and their name's gonna be read at graduation, I know that's a moment in time and a yearbook is captured. Um, is it the name? Uh, is it uh, the permanence? The uh, research reads, uh, like I said, it's very mixed with other, other deaths. Like the page from the family would be fine. Um, that would work, but as far as everything I've read for suicide, it sh uh, someone who commits suicide should not be part of that. And I know that might be, seem harsh or not, but I think that's for the health of the community, the health of the student body. And it's unfortunate, but I, I truly believe that all this research tells, would tell you, and you would agree if you read it, that it is detrimental to add someone who committed suicide to the graduation proceedings, the yearbook proceedings. And there you can take it again that it is not so detrimental to do it on the other side. So I'll, I'm just saying that it's, and it's just my opinion and that if we're gonna do with it, and I'm not gonna argue, I think it's, you know, I kind of think it's good to remember somebody who tragically passed or, you know, in a, in, in a non, I guess it was a suicide way, but and I, I can totally understand and and believe with the research and believe with my heart that it's would be dangerous to put 
someone who committed suicide and create a page to memorialize them forever in somebody's yearbook. Because even now, years later, people struggle. So if you're struggling from a friend's death or someone he went to school with, and you go to that book five years later, it's going to break your heart. And it's going to bring up emotions that you could possibly get over. You, we just can't do that. Our, I don't think our young people are prepared to, to um, you know, break that apart. They're still so attached to the emotion of something like that. So you're getting your kids who are going to school and who are you know, going away to college who are super struggling, and they're still sad with that memory. And this book gives them whatever it is to hold on. And it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's hard. And, um, and I, I know that for a fact in what we as a family and we as, uh, have dealt with, but I know that more in a fact of hundreds of pages of research that say do not honor someone who committed suicide in a, especially a high school book. If you push out further where people are more mature and they can understand and handle it, it's one thing. I truly believe it will be detrimental if we have a page of pictures of someone who committed suicide living on forever in the yearbook. Do you feel that way also for tragic death in general? I'm just curious. No. Do you think we should take that piece out? If, if that's what the board and the administration wants, and I can understand it because that is almost beautiful. Um, it's, almost, it's almost like it's deserving. But uh, I'll still stand that we should not. We need to break away. Just my opinion. It's not. So. It okay. says, don't memorialize anybody different. But if you, and basically some of them say, if you do, be consistent in that, but not a suicide. Any other? It's hard. Yeah, I, it's hard. I understand it's hard because we want to be consistent. I think that's so what we're trying difficult. to get. Right. It's difficult for me to speak to it. I understand. And I understand it's, diff it's, emo it's, it's hard for people to deal with, but we have to trust what research shows us and and I can attest that it is. It would make young people's lives very difficult for years for years out. I appreciate you sharing that. I know it's hard to talk about, and we really do care what you're saying. So uh, right. what I would think is, you know, and, and I'm interested in your opinion, but I like the consistency that we've built this policy on. So for me, I would rather remove that that entirely instead of. I'm not comfortable separating. We'll allow it for you, but we won't allow it for you. I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable right. with that personally. I would like to hear what other people have to say, but I would rather see it come out and be consistent and keep the policy strong. And again, have those allowable things because I think there's so much good that can be done in the permissible things that we have in here that I'd hate to take that out and start chopping it up so much where we can't do some of those great things. Right. But if we're stuck on this and we agree that we're stuck on it, it's better to come out as a whole piece. Um, that's my opinion, but I'll turn it over to the board members. Um, I, I actually want to hear from Mr. Murphy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting I'm, you on the spot. I'm honestly struggling with it. Yeah, it's hard. Um, I, I defer to the history and the expertise, which is what we've been doing all along. And acknowledging that in the expertise and the uncomfortable conversations that we've been having, that I would cite that and they would come up with a counter paper that says, well, it doesn't say never. Um, but this is pretty adamant and clear, as, as you said. Um, and mine is part of the continuum in terms of full transparency, both what has happened in the past and what we've promised for the future in the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, so integrity and, 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 and following through with our promises, I think, is similarly important. Um, Well, we're still at stage one, so let's talk about where we're at. We're still at the very beginning of this. We're having conversation. We can consider striking that bullet, moving it forward. We can consider keeping it where it's at. We have some options here, but I would like to keep having conversation, moving it forward, because it's a long time coming, and I think at some point we're going to have to make a decision, especially on something like that. So. Um, you know, I'm just going to kind of throw it out there where people are comfortable in terms of moving the policy forward or um, looking to make an edit at this point. 
how will we how will we understand more how are we going to move forward from this i think we have to come to a consensus is really where, where i feel we're at and and i think we also have to understand that because it's almost march and this policy is not through the process that there is a yearbook coming out and i'm not sure what's in it <laughs> so if, if you know we can't again we can't pull back on what no, might uh, be uh, information uh, totally so we're talking about for next year at this point anyway right so there's no rush in terms of the yearbook piece for today because that is kind of this yearbook is kind of already probably done but i think we need to come to a consensus on do we want to move it forward as it is do we want to strike something and move it forward do we want to stay where we are so I'm trying to get an idea from everybody of where they're comfortable in terms of this policy. Stay where we are, meaning stay in stage one. Right, stay at stage one. Um, the, the, but does the rest of the board want to hear from an expert? Do they want to just get literature from an expert? I, I don't, I, I, you know what I'm saying? We. Right, how do we move forward? How do, you, how do we move forward? Because right, it sounds right. like it's it conflicting. Right. It, we we're gonna gonna it's emotional, but we need to know in our minds what the right thing is to do. We need a pathway right. 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 to right. move well, forward. Well, because it sounds like the research is conflicting, right? We're not always going to find the same exact information from all of the same places because we've gotten conflicting. I know Liz and I, when we worked on this, even policies are conflicting from other districts that we looked at. So but some, that, the one thing that's not conflicting is that in, under no circumstance should we include a, right. a student I have to or, say, we've, we found things that, that said within limits you can't. But, but has it been, how, how many years old is that research? The no, we found policies. The current research right? no, I, I saw, it, yeah, it, it has evolved so much um, that I and, think we need yeah. to, uh, you know, if you're looking at something, I, need, I think you need to look at something more present than what. Because even committed suicide is not a phrase that's used anymore. Died by suicide is a mm. There's so many changes and innuendos to, to make it easier for you to hear that than committed suicide as a violent act. They don't, it's, not, it's not healthy for the people who survived to hear that. So died by suicide. Don't Even the word anniversary is, is not supposed to be spoken in a way, in, in someone who died by suicide. Because anniversary gives a, a joyous, feel is meant to be a joyous day not a, a day like that so so many things have changed and that's it's not just someone they're actually doing research because we are i hate to say, we're spiraling to so many mass numbers of suicides that they are scrambling and changing their things so you you need to look at current and um you know the the, the all the current information that i've researched it is conflicting on regular deaths but not suicides they are so so set that that's a dangerous thing. We have a partnership with Northwell Health, don't we? And a, and a whole procedure there. Is there anyone that we could reach out to to get an expert to guide us in this? But I, I'm not sure if they would be the expert in something like this. They're, you know, they, they have their knowledge and, and they can speak to it. But, I, you know, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, and there are so many other things that we might be able to get a clearer clear uh, sign on that. Mr. O'Shea. Dr. Leahy? Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Leahy. <laughs> I was just going to suggest that uh, our postvention consultant, uh, Deb Caputo, would be a really good first resource to go to uh, for this. And she could probably point us to point to others. She's really very current in her research. And I think she has, uh, would, would very much like to weigh in on this. I, and uh, you know, I'll just put I'll put two cents in. I do have a relationship with Deb Caputo. We speak regularly, and I did show her the the um, the policy. I don't know if she reached out to you, Mr. Murphy. No, and I spoke to her last week, but she didn't mention this. No kidding. Okay, because I have a, I just have an email now, and, and but she's the one who has you know this is this is the way it is, and you really can't do it. So, but if to, if she would come in, if she could have the time, that would be. I think helpful for everybody else to okay. make, make a decision. Yeah. So leave it at stage one. Yeah. Invite a guest. Yes. Another guest. Not that you're not enough, Mr. Murphy, because you're always enough. But we will have a second guest, no and we'll go through it together, and okay. we'll we'll come to terms. And I think we're stuck on that one piece. Is yep. right. I Can think, we? Keep, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Anything else? That's fine. And the prohibited memorial activities. District student extra extra classroom activity funds cannot be used to support finance or fundraise for memorialization um, I think we need to maybe find better or clearer language on that also because 
the senior class donated you know, their fundraising two years ago to Ryan's Foundation. And that money went back to bring part, partially bring back sources of strength into the school. So I don't think, as you said before, we, it's, it, would be de it would be detrimental to eliminate things like that. And as long as... Um, but, but that can be done, that could be done more directly. Right? Couldn't that be done more directly than, than going through a foundation? And, and, and being Not really, because they, you know, they, they have the ability to raise only a small portion of the money where you know, a program like Source of Strength costs $18,000. So that's not likely that the senior class could fund the Source of Strength program in the school. But I guess you know, it, most of the time speakers cost more than that. So they decided to give as other has, you know, uh, senior classes are given to cancer research and things like that. And is, I don't know if that's the best way to put that or the best way to word that is what I'm trying to say. I would hate for a group not to say I, we can't give to them because you know there's a there's something in here when if if in fact it's doing good. I would always hope that they would research what something is going to be given to. But uh, okay, so we'll, we'll take it. Go ahead. Maybe there's a way. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we'll rework that wording a bit and give that some second thought too. How. <laughs> Talk to, I guess, you know, maybe if, you know, I, I sent the, the, the policy at the last meeting to Debbie Caputo, but I, I, I can reach out again and see if she could give more specific criteria before she comes and speaks. If we can get her to come and speak. She's a well, very, we she's can a very also, busy the policy woman. Commi well, yeah. Excuse me? Nothing. I was going to say the policy committee could meet with her, but it would really be better. Yeah. For all of us. I'm wondering, too, at the end of that sentence, it says um, the ECAV funds cannot be used to support finance or fundraise for memorialization. As opposed to, yeah, but it's you know. it's uh, extracurricular fund can't be used to support. Okay, I read that wrong. Then just for specific memorialization. I, I, I I'm thinking, right. but I, I think it should be clarified. I but think we have when to I'm reading the, the sentence, maybe that was the intent. Right. It needs to be more precise. Yeah. Yes. Because if that's if that is what memorialization is, if it's a, if it's giving money to a foundation to do something else or that's creating some memorial that is improper, right? right. The rest like of if it's meant to do okay. sources of strength right. or something beneficial, that has to be differentiated from right. what we're intending it not to be right. used for. Oh, yeah. so in this wording, it was meant to say put up a. I, a I'm just uh, a I think it needs again, it's, it's open to interpretation, like so I think yeah. we have to strengthen just, it. Okay. But I'm right. that's okay. how I'm reading it. The fact that we're having a conversation about it and we can't definitively say what it means is a problem. It has to be fixed. And I really think you have, we, you have to look at that, the word, including commencement and the prohibited activities. If, you, if, if you're going to go back to adding commencement to it, 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 just, you know, it just needs to be clearer. Because you don't want to deal with somebody who is very upset and saying, but it says here I can do this and I can't do it here. So you don't want to deal with that at that time. It's an emotional time when somebody's going through that. So. It's so much better, safer. Um, it's, it's not going to be easy, but it's you know it's uh, this is our policy. I'm sorry. This is what you know. This is the this is where the school district is going, and that's that's the purpose of this: not to deal with an emotion at a certain time, not to have to deal with it, and not to have to make that emotion worse for the person who's coming in. That you know, that's what we're that's what we're trying to attempt, right, Mr. Yeah. Murphy? That's correct. And, and we need to because it's. Too, too traumatic for the family that's involved that they have to. And again, it's nice to have in place because there are many things we can do to honor people in the right way. So right. I, I like having the policy. We don't want it to be about all the things we can't do because there are so many things we can do to honor people and it's the appropriate is what we're looking for. So um, we know what we have to fix. We're going to work on, get a speaker. We're keeping it stage one. We thank you so much, and we'll have you join us again, which I know you're going to love to do. And um, we'll, let you, we'll let you move on to your IB. Um, I know you had an IB announcement today. Oh, yeah, I guess that's what you wanted me to do first. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so there's a lot of external um, agencies now that are, that are creating positions in terms of what to do moving forward for our students, especially with regard to final exams, whether they're regents exams, um, IB or AP exams. So uh, within the last two weeks, there's been an evolutionary process um, 
the first of whom was the uh, IB Diploma Program, who's been in contact with schools both regionally and throughout the globe in terms of soliciting um, where we are and developing a protocol that, that puts the kids first without compromising their transcripts or their, or their moving forward, but also recognizing their current circumstances. The College Board is doing it at the same time in the context of what their assessment policy is. So they started surveying schools about four weeks ago, um, looking at options, looking at last year's um, rollout that where there were no May IB exams, looking how they could learn from that. And so they ultimately came up with a survey saying, you, if there were two options, which ones can you physically do? Meaning not, not what, what would you rather, but are you physically capable of administering exams in May based on your current ex ex experience right here, right now? Um, and number two, could you do the alternate route? Um, so that started the process that we did include student surveys in. Because, not that it was the debilitating factor, but we wanted to hear from the students as well. So it was, can we physically administer exams to our IB students during May and keep the schools open based on our current circumstances, which would mean, among other things, closing um, the gym for the month of May, um, putting 200 to 250 students in restricted spaces, because a lot of the exam spaces that we normally would use are now being taken up for classroom space because we've had to reconfigure the classrooms. Um, Compounded by, I won't go through the whole logistics, but how do you keep students together but in the exam and maintain the integrity of the exam without clustering them? How do you bring in proctors when you can't hire new proctors but the teachers can't proctor their own students? So there was a series of avenues so that um, we, we deduced um, that based on the sheer volume of exams that we give, which is in the, in the vicinity of 1,300, exams over the course of three weeks, the number of students involved, which is 450, that we couldn't physically administer the exams um, during May. So the alternate route that is suggested does three things. It maintains the integrity and the, um, of the student transcript. It gives them the opportunity to earn an IB score, and it uses the coursework and the assessments that they've already completed for that model, meaning the difference between the IB model and the other standards is that the coursework is the exam. Meaning, in IB theater, there's no change because there is no IB theater exam. It's an assessment portfolio that the kids create over two years and it's mail out. The same thing with IB film or art. And there's different modalities and different coursework, written exams, lab components, performance pieces that are done throughout the two years that are also sent to examiners. They created a system whereby that work, which is usually internally assessed and then moderated, all gets sent out as if it were an exam and, and graded externally so that the student's work throughout the two years is validated. They're graded by IB examiners. The teachers then have input because they're in the class with the students for the two years and have given IB-like assessments and can provide assessments, and a compilation of those come together and create an IB score for the students that does three things. It gives them the, the transcript. They don't have, in other words, the students moving forward don't have to do anything extra for this route. It's already, for all intents and purposes, done, or almost done. There's a couple of assessments that are still being mailed out. Their IB transcript and their IB grade is intact. The student surveys that we completed were aligned with the thoughts of the teachers in that even if I could sit safely in a gym in May for an exam, I don't think it's a valid measure because we were out of school for the last five months. It's a two-year program. We've had hybrid learning for this. So even if they change the exam, how are they to know which part we focused on and which part we lost, given the learning that's occurred and the stress? And the last thing I need, having been through this for the last year, is a sit-down IB exam. So that was nearly universal from the students. It wasn't, ba it wasn't the basis of the IB decision, but it did inform ours. And the teachers um, similarly felt that it would have been unfair 
as well as unreliable given the nature of the IB assessments. So the decision was made to go the non-exam route, um, which means the students don't have to do anything per se in terms of work and curriculum in order to receive the credit that they deserve for their IB work. We do in terms of preparing and, and creating and uploading and sending the work to examiners. Student, it, it was an all or nothing dichotomy. We, we, the choice was either to go the exam or the non-exam route. And most of the districts in the area with programs of similar size to ours adopted the same route. If a student, for whatever reason, chooses not to have that option, and for whatever reason chooses not to have the, the, the work externally graded, they do up until mid-April can inform us, I don't want my graded work, which is fine. Um, they are refunded and um, the IB just gets taken off of the transcript grade, uh, of the transcript, meaning it's not IB English anymore because the IB assessments haven't been validated, but the coursework and the grade stays intact on their transcript. Questions? Is Great. <laughs> Mr. Murphy, is there anything on the transcript that will note that we've gone non-exam? No. Okay. Um, is there any negative? I would rather have sit down exams because it's what we're accustomed to. It adds another layer. It's closure for the students. If it were fair, if it were a valid measure, if I could do it safely, if I could guarantee that the content that was, that was addressed was the content that would appear on that exam. And I can do none of the above. Mr. Murphy, will it matter in terms of the colleges accepting the credits for various levels? Do you think it will have any effect on our students if they haven't taken an actual outside assessment versus the inside assessment? No, and that's why you don't make the designation, because I, that would be unfair. Is there any conversation about regions yet? Well, at uh, 3 o'clock yesterday, the New York State uh, Board of Regents uh, sent out a very pithy and a very concise statement on Regents exams that did absolutely nothing to clarify things. Mm -hmm. Basically, it said the, New York, the United States Department of Education denied for the second time their waiver for New York State Regents exams in three to eight testing. However, the state's not finished, and the synopsis, and there's a lot of gray area here, um, is that while they will not grant a statewide waiver for regents exams, they will allow and are ad 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 advocating not making the regents exams a graduation requirement, to use their term, uncoupling the regents exams and the assessments from teacher evaluations to not make students who are remote learners required to sit the exam and to quote unquote afford states other flexibilities such as modifying the exam, which I don't know how they can do in, in 12 weeks. So the state said they are not done and they will create clarification, um, both with regard to three to eight testing, which they seem to say is is on, mm -hmm. um, and the exams that they're mandating are only those that the Department of Education is. So if a Regents exam is not a graduation requirement, then they say do whatever you like. So it's a defining of what those Regents exams are that they're saying, this is what you have to do. Define, you have to, but it's not a graduation requirement and it's not used for teacher evaluation. And it's getting late. And it's getting late. Yeah. I would and say stay tuned. I know that there's yeah. been a lot of talk between many of the organizations and particularly the groups that are advocating um, for relief from, from the Regents' exams. Uh, 
there's been a lot of talk, but not a lot. So it's a lot of conjecturing between the people who feel like they're in the conversation, but it's not gonna be official until they do make a decision and, and give something down. I'm, I'm hoping, and I know a lot of the uh, people, my colleagues are pressing for some information within the next couple of weeks, because once you enter March into April, it's kind of, kind of need to know. So uh, stay tuned, and what uh, Principal Murphy was saying is absolutely correct. It, the vagaries are not helpful right now. And the college board is coming out with supplemental information by midweek, so we should have a more definitive <coughs> response to that as well. Because I know you're sending out that information real time to the parents that this is affecting. I know that letter went out today. I expect we'll do the same thing for when we have more information about 3 8 testing and also. <coughs> Bob Kroger is tired and wants to go. Home, isn't he? He's trying to tell us something. All right, any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Just like to add something while while I was speaking, and I, you know, North a representative from Northwell Health texted me and said they would be happy to give us two experts on the thing: someone from the Long Island Crisis Center and someone from Northwell Health. I, I mean, they're great partners with us for the mental health of our students, and uh, they they want they want to help us with this. Thank you. So okay, we'll we, have somebody get in touch with thanks. them. Thank you for that. Go home and enjoy. They're watching. <laughs> Thank you. Not that your whole night isn't over as it is, but we appreciate you, Mr. Murphy. We'll see you next week. All right. Thank you, Joe. The man of the hour at this time every year is Mr. Bartels. So, Mr. Chang, I'll let you introduce Mr. Bartels in our budget. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, this is the first time a budget process has been unfamiliar to me in about six years. Uh, but having uh, Mr. Bartels and being able to work with him about the knowledges that I've had and understanding the process that he's gone through, uh, we had lengthy conversations about uh, a focus on the budget uh, and having an idea of what is it that we're focusing on as a district uh, to give uh, a life to the numbers that we um, are looking at. So our, our Primary focus, of course, is our students, and we want to make sure that everything that we do in the context of the budget is to impact and have a reach to our students individually and collectively as, as a whole. Uh, so this budget has focused on what we are looking at as academic supports and direct academic assistance and infusion of academic practices uh, within this budget. We're focusing on mental health in this budget. And we're also focusing on compounding the effects of all the good that has been here already and that's been built on uh, for uh, the reputation that is Rockville Center. That's kind of the primary focus of where we started for him. And Mr. Bartels will go through our budgetary goals that came out of that, that, those conversations and what this budget represents and uh, where we will be heading and what we were looking to uh, create as going into uh, the 21-22 school year. Mr. Bartel. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Uh, as many of you know, we go through this process every year. Uh, we start back in October, November, uh, working with all of the directors, principals, uh, putting together their requests uh, for the following year's budget. Uh, this is going to be a little different presentation than uh, we've done in the past. We're going to try to do uh, uh, more of a narrative presentation and try not to get into the detail of the line-by-line -line budgets, although that uh, budget is, uh, I believe, out in the lobby. It should be online uh, as well. Um, we find ourselves in a interesting position this year, uh, so we've been coming at the budget a little differently uh, with the pandemic and uh, the way we finished up last year and just the way we've gone through this year. Uh, we've had uh, a number of different things happen, which has, we've been able to put money into fund balance. We'd be able to find some creative ways to uh, save and uh, look at things a little bit differently. So um, that said, we're gonna, we'll go through um, some of the goals. Uh, I'm going to start with some of the budget goals, then I'll go into some detail on uh, some of the different key budget lines, uh, the expenses and the revenues, uh, talk about the budget summary, uh, and then kind of go through the budget timeline. 
Uh, this is kind of a little reverse of how I usually do the presentation. I usually start with the timeline and go through some uh, basics and, and not get into items until the next budget meeting. But uh, we're trying to consolidate things a little bit this year uh, with everything going on. So some of our budget goals uh, that Mr. Chung had, had spoken about that we're looking at was uh, we want to go into next year without cutting any programs or any of the full-time staffing, uh, and that's unless it's enrollment-driven. So if we don't have enough students signing up for a course at the secondary level, uh, if there are uh, fewer students that enroll at the elementary level, we don't uh, need to split classes, uh, that, that could impact staffing. Uh, we want to improve our educational activities as, as much as we can, uh, strengthen some of our support programs for students and academic achievement, uh, provide additional support for our special education programs. Uh, we need to maintain our professional development. I know that's kind of taken a little bit of a hit uh, this year right, as we can't bring our, our staff together as much as we'd like, uh, so we want to get back to that. We uh, want to maintain our district facilities. Um, it's been a while since we've uh, had our bond issue. We've been continuing to support uh, building projects through uh, transfers to capital in the budget. Uh, and that's, uh, that's going to be a big part of the budget discussion this year is uh, the debt service and, and how that impacts us going forward. Uh, and finally, limit the tax burden on the homeowners. Uh, we know it's been very difficult uh, these times in, on Long Island and the taxes that everybody faces uh, are, are always ever increasing uh, and are very difficult for many of our, many of our residents to maintain. So we talk about no cuts to our programs. Uh, we're gonna continue everything as we have in the past, maintaining elementary class size guideline of keeping all of our classes less than or equal to 25 students at the elementary level. Uh, all of our existing programs uh, that we're running this year are going to continue into next year. Uh, we have some provisions for contingency staffing uh, each year. Uh, we're unsure of all of our needs as far as teacher aides and teaching assistants uh, that may come about as a result of CSEs um, or other circumstances um, and at the elementary levels we're budgeting the same number of teachers for next year as we are for this year so this year we have 78 elementary sections uh, classroom level sections in our projections for next year uh, we have done most of our kindergarten registrations uh, we believe uh, covert should probably be the same number of sections next year as they are this year. Uh, their kindergarten enrollment does not look like it's going to be more than two sections. We have two sections of fifth grade graduating. There is one section, I believe it's uh, third grade, that has 50 students right now, but I believe there's one or two students out of the country and they expect them to come back. So that should stay at three sections for next year. Uh, Hewitt, we're not projecting any changes. Uh, I believe based on our kindergarten enrollments, we have four sections leaving us in fifth grade. We'll have four sections coming in. And it doesn't look like we're gonna have any other changes within the building. Uh, Riverside uh, looks like we're only gonna have one section of kindergarten coming in and we have two sections leaving. So we would expect to be down a section there. Uh, there are also a couple of classes at Riverside that are very close to 25. I think we have two, two classes that are at 26. So if we lose one or two students there, we could be down another section. Uh, at Watson, uh, we have three sections of fifth grade leaving. That was a little anomaly. We had uh, two, two grade levels of three sections each. This, so they're finally leaving uh, Watson. We have two kindergarten sections coming in, so they should be down one section as well. And then Wilson, uh, again, we're projecting no changes. Three, three fifth grade leaving and three kindergartens coming in. So uh, overall, we have probably two extra teachers, uh, pretty certain uh, in that budget. So that would be two contingent staff members for next year. So again, 
a little bit of contingency within the budget to make sure we meet our needs. We want, we're looking to improve some of the educational activities. Uh, we've talked about this a few times, providing kindergarten specials uh, in the past, haven't really figured out a way to do it. Uh, we believe uh, we have, through some rescheduling, we'll be able to provide kindergarten specials with our uh, regular teachers, uh, and it will not be just working with teacher aides or assistants. So we want to uh, inject those specials to all of our kindergarten students. Um, we're not exactly sure to what extent we're going to be able to do that at this point. Uh, we would love to get the same level of support, uh, same level of specials in for kindergarten as we do for our other grade levels. Um, so we are continuing to look at that, but uh, we are definitely going to be doing something with for specials for kindergarten. Uh, American Sign Language, we've talked about in the past. Uh, we have not uh, had enough to um, open a class at the high school, but we do have uh, in the budget uh, enough money for two sections of American Sign Language should we need it. Uh, one of the problems we've had with that is finding an American Sign Language teacher. So I know Dr. Leahy has been looking at other avenues, other resources to try to get uh, somebody that would be able to do that for us. So uh, that discussion continues. Uh, we've provided for some additional software programming for data protection um, within our software programs and also for remote learning enhancements. Um, going remote uh, last year and this year uh, for a number of students, um, there are a lot of different resources that we've taken advantage of and we continue to look for new, uh, new and exciting programs for our students and I know uh, everybody in our curriculum is, is looking at those. Um, we're also looking to expand the Chromebooks to all of our middle school students uh, next year. So that's something we had done at the high school this year, uh, provided Chromebooks. So we're looking to expand that uh, at the middle school for next year. Uh, to strengthen our support programs, uh, we had added another math implementation teacher for the current year. We're looking to add one more math implementation teacher, again, to help our elementary students who are struggling with math concepts. Uh, we're looking to add one full-time reading teacher uh, to support some of our struggling readers. Uh, and we want to add an additional guidance counselor at the ele elementary level to continue to provide social and emotional support. Uh, we had uh, begun with one uh, guidance counselor at the elementary level. Uh, work, who's worked out absolutely terrifically and uh, we'd like to provide them some additional help uh, and to get that so we have more support at the elementary level. We need to increase our support for our special education programs. Uh, right now we have uh, one administrator who's equivalent of about a half time person. Uh, we're looking for that person to become a full-time uh, administrator uh, to continue to support our uh, CSE, CPSE program, our RISE and our uh, core programs and all the other uh, social emotional programs that are run um, in pupil personnel. Uh, we have our RISE program which will be moving up to the middle school for the first time next year. Uh, we have a 0.6 a full-time equivalent special ed teacher added to the budget uh, to cover that uh, additional workload. Uh, we'll be also renovation, renovating a small classroom and some storage space in the middle school to accommodate that program. Uh, we're going to continue our work with uh, Northwell Health to continue to support our students in need. Uh, and we have added uh, Go Guardian software uh, program which uh, will alert uh, the school district of social and emotional concerns uh, in student work and uh, through their internet searches. So we'll be able, software will kind of pick up on some of those different things and uh, assist us in uh, more of our social emotional um, tasks. We want to get back to continuing our professional development program. Uh, we have mentors uh, within the district that we continue to use with our newer teachers. 
Uh, I want to get our staff development program back up at Riverside um, and get that going again. Uh, and we need to continue all of our programs that we run through BOCES, uh, through our grants, that keep teachers uh, up to speed um, with all the different requirements that we have with curriculum changes, uh, with different state requirements. Uh, I know uh, Janine um, and Sonia will be doing that, uh, working closely with our staff. Uh, it's kind of fallen off a little bit this year because of the uh, pandemic and, and the need to keep people separated. Uh, but that's been a, a strong program that we've had in the past, and uh, I think we need to get back to that and, uh, and continue with that. We need to continue to maintain our district facilities. Um, so we have replacement of older equipment and uh, equipment upgrades in the budget. Uh, we're going to continue our budget line transfer to capital uh, to address maintenance, building uh, up maintenance concerns and building upgrades, uh, although we're going to change the way we fund that a little bit. We're going to do a little reduction. I'll explain that more in a little bit. Uh, we need to continue to address our health and safety concerns uh, within our buildings. We have fencing repairs that need to happen, uh, building security upgrades, environmental controls. And we have uh, our board members have been walking the buildings um, this month and we'll be able to use those uh, discussions and those findings from them to put together our list of uh, capital projects that we want to put in place for next year. So uh, we'll be talking that in uh, future budget meetings. Uh, we also want to move to an electronic time card system uh, to eliminate punch cards. We, we still have uh, punch clocks uh, in all of our buildings. Uh, it's kind of an older system. We have not really moved forward with upgrading that, uh, but just in, in looking to eliminate all the paper and the time cards and, and try to streamline everything, uh, we'd like to move to an electronic time card system uh, to take care of that and roll all of our timekeeping directly into our payroll records and attendance. So, end up with wanting to limit the tax burden on the homeowners. As everybody knows the Nassau reassessment has been a complete fiasco. Um, the uh, budget uh, uh, assessment increases people have seen and their tax increases I've seen some people come back with $15,000 tax increases, other people with $5,000 tax decreases. Uh, it's been crazy and it's very difficult to try to explain this to different homeowners. Um, so this, this year has been very difficult for many to, um, many to get through for a number of different reasons. Uh, it's been a tough economic year. The pandemic has just, uh, hurt many, many people, many businesses. The income is just not there for many, many families. Uh, residents continue to voice their concern about high taxes. Um, it's nothing new, uh, just, uh, just a continuation. Uh, so we're continuing to utilize our reserves and our savings from the pandemic shutdown. We were able to put money into our reserves last year. Uh, we're able to save some monies this year from not running many of the programs that we normally run uh, or after school activities and so forth. Uh, our debt service is gonna provide us with some substantial relief this year. Um, I'll show you a chart in a minute, but we're dropping close to $900,000 off of our debt service for next year. So that's, uh, that's gonna be a big help in the budget. Uh, we've continued to work with our bargaining units uh, to negotiate uh, uh, agreements that stay within a total increase of 2% um, in their contracts uh, to keep pace with the uh, tax cap increases that we have uh, in place for us. Uh, and by doing all that this year, we're actually going to have no change in the tax levy for next year. So we're going to actually freeze our tax levy going from this year into next year. There'll be no increase. Some of the ways we've done that are key budget lines, 
as I mentioned, we have a reduction in our debt service. It's actually $786,000. Uh, so that was, you know, one key start um, in doing that. We're going to reduce our transfer to capital line by 50% or reduce that by another $900,000. We have $1.8 in there for this year. We're going to reduce that to $900,000. Uh, we don't want to hurt our programs going forward. However, next year we have another half million dollars coming off of debt service as well. So we'll be able to increase that number back up again by another half million dollars next year without any impact on the tax levy or the, or the budget. So we'll have just you know, kind of shifting in lines. So we'll be able to keep that money there so uh, we can continue to provide, for, provide support for our buildings. Uh, health, health insurance had very favorable premium increases for the last couple of years, a lot less than we had projected. So we're going to have no change to that budget line this year. That, from year to year, can provide a very large increase in the budget. Uh, same thing with ERS and TRS, our employer contributions, very small increase, and we're going to deal with that through our reserves. So we're not going to be increasing those budget lines either. Uh, we've added uh, arts in motion, so this was a recommendation from our auditors. Um, each year we put a small amount of money in our arts and uh, education program, uh, and then it's funded through additional contributions by the PTAs. So what I've done this year is I put the full amount, uh, what we're kind of expecting for next year, of $100,000 into the budget. I've also increased our revenue side by $100,000, so if we don't get the donations, if we don't get the... Uh, PTA contributions, we don't have the expenses, so either way, it, it'll be fine. Uh, we are down over $100,000 in, in private school tuitions. Uh, I know Dr. Leahy's uh, constantly looking to keep students in district, and if students are out of district, trying to get them back. Uh, so that's been, uh, that's been a big help. Our staffing budget overall is up $1.5 million in total staffing. Uh, it's up about 470,000 in new staffing and about 100,000 in contingency staffing. On the revenue side, again, we're having no increase in the tax levy. Uh, I think that's so important. We're actually in a year this year with several things coming together that we could do this. Uh, and I think it's, it's something great and uh, time has come where we really need to do that here in Rockville Center. Um, we do have a reduction in our state aid projections uh, with uh, COVID and the, uh, and the governor's budget. He has projected a little bit less of an increase, uh, a little bit less of a state aid projection for next year than what we're getting this year. Uh, it's not a big difference, but we're actually down from last year anyway because most of our aid or much of our aid is based on expense-driven uh, items such as transportation and BOCES and with the shutdown in the spring, we did not have so much in those expenses, so we didn't get the aid that we were expecting on that. So it's not as big as a hit as it may have been. Uh, we have an increase in our pilot payments. Uh, Avalon Bay uh, and those apartments continue to provide additional increases each year uh, as their pilot um, programs get underway. Uh, so we're con we should be seeing some increases from them each year to help support our budget. Um, as I mentioned, we increased the uh, Arts in Motion gifts and donations to offset the expenses. Uh, and we're going to continue to use our reserves to fund ERS and TRS employer contributions. So just talk about a couple of these items. So state aid uh, for the current year, final state budget for last year projected we were going to get $13.2 million. We put in our budget 12.8 to balance the budget. Uh, looks like we're only going to get about 12.3 million. So while that is a, is a big reduction uh, and so forth. We're in pretty good shape because we really haven't had all of the expenditures because of the limited activities that we had here uh, over, the, over the past year. For next year, uh, the final state budget 
uh, is projecting us to have 12,580,000. Um, we're going to budget pretty close to that, slightly less, uh, 12,560 to balance the budget. When you look at our budget breakdown and the way we spend our money, uh, you can see the great majority, uh, over 80%, goes directly to salaries and benefits. So that's the largest portion of our budget. Um, then we drop down into our debt and our capital expenses, transportation expenses, tuitions, technologies, utilities, and then everything else. So. When I talk about everything else, we're talking about these are all the director's budgets, the principal's budgets. Uh, so uh, all of our um, equipment, a lot of our equipment that we have. So there's not a lot left that we really have um, uh, control over, which would actually impact the overall budget. If we cut something out of there, it's going to be a small, small number. It's not going to impact that much where we really have the budget driven is through salaries and benefits. This is, uh, this may be a little difficult to read, um, but this is our change in our debt service. So uh, we're, what I have is in those yellow columns, the total dollar change in our debt service from one year to the next. So you can see in 21-22, the drop off of $786,000. In 22-23, we have a drop off of almost $550,000. And then it stays relatively flat until 28-29 when we see another 100,000 drop off. So uh, as I was saying, if we reduce our transfer to capital to 900,000 for this year, we can increase it back up a little bit next year uh, without any real impact to the budget, but we'll be able to keep our commitment to our facilities strong. And we'll also be able to use that number uh, if we are uh, continue with our discussions about a bond issue. We haven't done one in almost 10 years now. Um, so those discussions may, uh, may begin shortly. As far as our budget summary, uh, our total proposed budget is up uh, almost $600,000, which is less than half a percent. Uh, that increase will be fully funded by our local revenues and our reserves. Uh, so you can see the zero change in our tax levy, uh, the reduction in our state aid, but the increase in the local revenues and our reserves, the use of our reserves. Uh, so we'll be able to keep the budget increase low and the tax levy zero. Uh, our budget timeline, uh, today we have our first uh, budget discussion. I uh, wanted to try to summarize as much as I could for you without getting into, into too much detail. Uh, March 1st is our tax cap filing with the state. Uh, our tax cap this year which has really been driven down by the uh, capital with the reduction in the debt service and the reduction in the transfer to capital. Our, our, our tax cap for this year will be 0.03%, uh, so it'll be basically zero. But as I said, I've driven that down by reducing those uh, capital lines. Uh, if the capital lines were the same, our tax, our tax cap this year would have been close to 1.5%. But with the reduction of, of those capital lines, brings it down to just about zero. Uh, March 25th will be our next budget discussion. Uh, hopefully we'll get into a little more detail on the programs and, and staffing, uh, some of the things that we talked about today. Uh, April 19th is the last day to file petitions for the board. Uh, April 20th is our preliminary budget hearing. That's the last day we can actually make changes to the budget. Uh, May 6th is our formal budget hearing, but on that date, no changes are allowed. And then May 18th is the culmination with the annual election and budget vote. That's it. I don't know what, what point we were supposed to stand up and applaud <laughs> the tax levy being zero. I think that's the, the highlight, obviously, for us. 
lived in town for a long time. I don't know that I've ever seen that happen before, but in a year like this, and also balanced with all the things that are being added to our budget and what we're being able to afford the children at the same time of keeping the tax levy to zero is just a wonder. So thank you very much, everybody that put their time into it. I'm gonna, I'll start with some questions and then I'll pass it over to the board. Um, in terms of some of the staffing, I know we have some things that we're budgeting sections and we have, um, we're probably gonna be under the amount of sections budgeted, so there might be some room there. Um, do we have contingency thoughts about how to spend that money or what would happen to that money if we do go under sections? Are there other thoughts about what would happen if we only had 75 sections of students versus 78? Well, that money typically would be held for further contingencies going in, you know, down, the, down the, the line in the year. Uh, as I said, we, we never know what's going to happen with some of our CSEs. If we have uh, students move into the district with disabilities that are going to a private school placement, okay. uh, we may have no choice but to fund that. So we always have contingencies. We have to always be careful about that. Uh, but if we don't use it, it would turn into, it would go towards our fund balance for the following year. Okay, good. And I know we t you talked about um, not finalizing just yet what kindergarten specials might look like, so we don't know if they would look like grades one to five or if they might be less in the cycle, but could we get a kind of a budget sense of, at the max, what might we need to make that happen? Do we need anybody? Do, would we possibly need part-time um, increases or full-time increases? Could we just get an idea of what the high end might be to make kindergarten specials look like grades one through five? Um, we're continuing to get uh, projections from our directors of music and the arts and, and our athletic director. Uh, we're n if we were to do it completely, I don't think we would need more than one full-time equivalent teacher to do that. As I said, we're, st we're still working on those, but I would expect that might if, you, if you're looking at what, what would the most be, I would say that probably would be the most additional staff that we would need. And, okay. and that would be in pieces for some of the different okay. uh, point one here. It's just good to have an idea of as we go forward, so it's not a surprise later if mm -hmm. we do decide to go that route, we have an idea of what it might be. Mm -hmm. And just something I w I'd not known about, but the Go Guardian, um, which would be new. Are we using anything similar to that now, or is this completely new for us, Dr. Lee? Completely new? I think we've, we've started that this year. No, we haven't started it no, yet. No, not yet. Uh, it's com a completely new product. It, it, uh, it works with the Chromebooks, okay. which is why now we'll, we're able to do it. That's wonderful. I know that's a great addition, and I'm, I'm really excited about the second guidance counselor as well at the elementary level, especially in the times that we're living through right now. She's been wonderful for the district, so to add another one, I think, is fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that. We just have to find another one of her. Just like of her, <laughs> right, of course. Yeah. I just want to clarify something. We are using Go Guardian currently in our Chromebooks as our management system. Okay. There is an additional piece okay. that you could look at in terms of monitoring. But for the current Chromebooks that we have, Go Guardian is our device management system. Okay. okay. So this is a new, like a kind of a new component. Also. This is it called is, Go Guardian Beacon. Yeah, okay. So there's, there's two different components <clears throat> to Go Guardian, but we do need the Go Guardian to manage the devices we currently have. We will continue that with the middle school, but we still also have iPads, and we will use, right. um, I think it's Light Speed <laughs> for the, uh, iPod, for the okay. iPads. Thank you for clarifying. Thanks. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Barry, questions for the budget? Yeah, some of them have been asked already. Thank you. Um, I'm also happy to see the addition of the guidance counselor at the elementary level. I think that's wonderful. I'm wondering about the need and demand at the secondary level, especially post-COVID and the stresses on our students system-wide. So is there adequate support you think in place, just thinking proactively as we look to bring students back at the secondary level in that area? Yeah, but I think that's always, a, mental health is, is ever progressing. So I think those are things that we're, we're, we're looking at. And I think this, the staffing wise, we, we've gotten in place. And going through this year, you know, a lot's going to tell going into next year as well. Uh, but in terms of sustaining uh, and, and, and 
understanding that we want to be able to support that s support all the way through, adding one at the elementary level where we're overstretched may be a benefit as it filters throughout the course. But it's something that we're always going to look at. Uh, but as of right now, the, the priority that we thought uh, was important at that mental health piece level to, to layer in was at the elementary level. That's great. Thank you. Um, how many current math and reading teachers do we have? Math implementation, I mean, and reading teacher. We're at. Math is easy. There are three of them. Reading, I, I don't have off the top of my head, but we have more reading than math currently in the buildings. And we added a math implementation last we, year. We did. And I know in terms of, you know, um, I, I, you know, I say our AIS numbers are fluid. We are concerned about the number of remote students coming back, especially at the primary level, our emergent readers. Um, so we are anticipating we will need some extra support there as well. Um, it's, you know, to, to hear students read and look at them write every day in person is different. And we acknowledge that, so we are anticipating um, support needed all around, especially there. And we also have a couple of home instructed students that might be coming back that's expressed interest in coming back as well. Because we had quite an increase in home instruction as well. And sorry, I didn't hear the answer to the current reading. I don't have that, Mrs. Oh, Barry. Sorry, <laughs> off the top sorry. of my head, I, I could do That's it quickly fine. for That's, you right now, but I'll get fine, it for no you. Problem. It's a lot more than three at, at per building, but it really depends on the building yeah. too, as well. Like Riverside's a small building, so um, there's one yeah. uh, versus in, in, in Hewitt School. There's a couple more, but off the, like a, a round number, I, I don't I don't have that right now. That's fine, thanks. I'm sorry I didn't hear you in the beginning. Um, and the GoGuardian software is good. I, I use it on the Chromebooks, and I think that's a valuable addition, the social-emotional piece. Um, and I think that's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, Mrs. Farazani? Some of them were answered <laughs> by my curriculum uh, counterpart. Um, in term, I'm really excited to see about the sign language addition, because it does help with um, children that may not be able to do their language requirement through other means, and we've been talking about that for years, at, at least at a PTA level when I was there, and I'm very excited to see that. How are we determining what the enrollment or the interest is in that? Because it said something in there about the depend, it's dependent upon enrollment. Yeah, well that would be based on the offerings from the high school uh, to see as they would do each year uh, to offer it to the students and see what type of interest there is in that program. Okay, and for the specials that you mentioned for kindergarten, is the full-time teacher that you're talking about for one particular special? No, it would, it would be bits and pieces between art, music, and phys ed. Okay. That's all. Mrs. Dion? Thank you. Um, first of all, yes, thank you very much. This is uh, very impressive, Mr. Bartels. I'm blown away. Um, I never thought I'd sit here with a 0% tax levy increase. Um, but before I get to that, um, the sign language, just circling back, have, do you know, has it been offered at the high school? Because I, right, they've, they've already chosen their classes for so next year? It, it hasn't yet. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing. Right, you yeah. know, <laughs> I, I, I can't tell you how many times I have attempted to get a teacher. Um, Every, sign, every school in the local area that offers a graduate or undergraduate program to certify American Sign Language teachers, I've contacted twice, spoken to the directors twice. I've advertised it on OLAS. I've advertised it in, even in uh, Mr. Bartels, let me just do a, a subscription for a few weeks to a, um, 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 a, a, a periodical that goes to uh, the hearing, hearing impaired community. Um, I've done called, put it out of my own uh, director's website several times. There are a couple of districts that have teachers I've tried to, not steal, but bought, to share. And uh, it's, I'm really turning, you know, I'm just not finding anybody. Uh, the, my uh, uh, set parents have brought some people forward, but they don't have the right certification. So we're, you know, really, this is a word of mouth thing. So if anybody knows of anyone that has an interest, is studying it, coming close to 
would like to interview for the job, we sure would. Uh, I'm beating the bushes, but it's really been difficult. Okay. Well, thank you. And good luck. Good luck there. <laughs> um, on, can you just talk for a moment, I guess, uh, Dr. Sampino, on Good Guardian? Does Does this look at our student searches what is what exactly is this doing i don't know the um, huh. piece that dr Leahy is talking about right now because we don't have it i only know that currently it's our management system to push right. out apps to um uh basically up updates the filters that they use so the, the filters are in place and that's what go guardian is used for there's another layer that dr Leahy is looking at um in terms of monitoring. Uh, filters do that, but I think this is another piece that we have to kind of do a little bit more research on. So I think there are two layers to this. There's the management system, which again, Go Guardian is for the Chromebooks, and Lightspeed is for the iPads, and they have filters, and that's how they push out things and, and manage them. And then there's this other piece that we're looking into. So I think it's, uh, they're, they're in the same product, but I think it's an additional add-on. Yeah, so this, Go Guardian Beacon will pick up on self injurious ideation, violent language, um, bu bullying language, um, and anything that's put into a, um, a search, an internet search, and also anything that's submitted work that's used on our server. So it, th th we're able to see in student writing and and, and certainly if they're if they're researching something that you know would be of concern. So it's actually being used by more and more districts now, and uh, the, the concerns that come up are who monitors it, who's notified, and Gold Guardian Beacon has actually come a long way with that in terms of putting on different levels of alert, allowing parents to take control of the supervision of the, of the product for a certain period of time. So, and, and it doesn't appear to be in the districts that I've spoken to so far, a really a, 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 an unmanageable number of alerts. Uh, that's, that can even be adjusted so that you know certain language, certain words are not ex included in the search. So there's a little bit more, um, you know, homework and research we have to do on our end, and we'll talk to you a little bit more extensively about the details of it, um, you know, as that as that comes to pass. But I think the time has come. I think it's a great presentation. We'll do it at a future meeting. I and mean, you've done that before with when you've captured data on drug and alcohol use and mm -hmm. you know um, surveys that you're doing with the students and things we're finding out about that age group. But I'd love to see that um, in, in real time when we're, we're using it. That'd be great. Any other questions, Mrs. Dion? Um, yeah, just Ms. Bartels. So as I said, I've, I've never seen a zero tax um, <laughs> increase. Is, is it sustainable? I mean, can, are, are we going to be hurt in the future because we're taking a zero this year? No, we, we won't. Um, the budget I build every year based on current salaries. So I have everybody's salaries in there. It's not like I've cut out salaries that are going to kind of come back to bite me next year. Uh, as I mentioned with the capital projects, uh, I'm not worried about being hurt uh, in that area of the budget because we have another level of debt service dropping off next year, uh, which we can make back up a little bit. Uh, we've been able to put a lot of money away in reserves, you know, at the end of last year, and this year we're running, we're running very well. Um, our expenses, you know, if we go back to normal, hopefully next year, uh, will pick up a little bit, but those are built into the budget. So it's, it's not like we've, we've cut those out. Our, our full transportation expenditures for athletics, for example, we're not spending that this year. Uh, but it's not cut out of the budget, it's still in there for next year. Same thing for a number of different areas. And, and like I said, some of the large pieces of the budget, uh, benefits-wise, health insurance, uh, retirement system contributions. These, these are budget items that we would expect to hurt us, you know, year in and year out. And we, we've had some large increases. We've we've had years where we've had to add a million dollars just to health insurance. So um, we're we're in good shape we're there right now. We're not expecting any large changes. And again, remember, I build some money in for fund balance every year. 
We expect to get $2.8 million back every year, one way or another. Um, so there are some additional monies in there uh, for various contingency reasons. So we don't know what's going to happen with the health insurance premium increase come next January. Uh, I'm not increasing our budget line this year, but I still have what I believe is extra money in there to address that that increase, whatever that may be. It should be about, I'm expecting it to be a 5% increase. If we don't have an increase in there, that again is extra money that gets added to fund balance. So um, I, I think we're, like I said, it's a very unique year and, and we're, in, we're in good shape to, to maintain that. Okay. I think we should just point out that your that your budget number is one two three four five yes. six seven <laughs> eight nine. Uh, yes, <laughs> when I was pretty much finished with uh, my budget and I took a look at it, uh, the number was actually one two three five four something. So, you know, I said this is the. Pretty much the one and only time we're going to be able to have that number. I thought it would be kind of fun to have that, that, you that are number math there. Geek. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thanks for having fun at the same yeah. time. So I reduced it a little bit just so we could have that number. Good job. Okay. The phone calls will come to you? Yes, they will. You're okay. <laughs> thank you. Mr. O'Shea? I just want to thank Robert for his insight into creating and forming our budget. and making such an unbelievable comment of a zero increase <laughs> in 11 years. Never heard anything close to that. So it's a great thing we can do for um, the community who de desperately, you know, everybody needs a little relief and this is, this is a good thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd also just like to say that, you know, this is by, Whenever you, you have an opportunity to do something like this, to bring a 0% tax levy, that's almost really good budgeting throughout many, many years. And it's by, by design that Robert is able to, Dr. Martell is able to kind of increase the services that we're looking to be able to provide and yet still be able to offer a 0% tax levy. And that it, it goes to the testament of his uh, financial prowess and to be able to keep us in financial health. Uh, so kudos to him on, on being able to achieve that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll open up any budget comments or questions to members of the community. So you can come up to this microphone over here. That's our guest microphone. This is our um, co community microphone. And you can just um, say your name and your address and ask your question or make your comment. Gina Marie Bounds, 24 Ardsley Place. Sorry. Sorry for uh, bringing up my notes, but I'm like too tired to remember anything I had thought. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chang, school administrators and the Board of Ed. Thank you for letting us speak tonight. I'd be remiss if I didn't start off by thanking the PPS staff, all the teachers, the board, and of course our nurse practitioner for all their added efforts this year. As I mentioned in my last uh, email to the board last week, I sincerely appreciate all these efforts educating our children during this challenging year. I come here tonight to ask that you do everything to bring our children back to school full time, including reevaluating your quarantine protocols. We can open the schools all that we want, but if the parents and the children are too afraid to come for fear of quarantining, preventing them from participating in outside activities and socializing, then the secondary level will remain a ghost town. And if these schools remain in such low in-school attendance, as we know now have, or even worse, we are in danger of losing our ability to re-engage our students to get them back into the school in a healthy and productive way. According to the CDC, in 2019, 6,189 children between the ages of one and 19 died by accident. And yet, we still put our children in cars, we buy houses with swimming pools, and as a mother of four of over 13 years, I have never once had a parent ask me if I own a firearm as I take care for their children. 2,938 children died by suicide. Last month alone, at Cohen's Children's ER, we saw six attempted suicides in just one night. 
ages between 12 and 16. 2,385 die by assault or homicide, and yet we allow our children to leave our care, trusting them to navigate the world without our protection. Since this pandemic started 12 months ago, 250 children in the entire country between the ages of 1 and 19 have died from COVID. That's 0.07% of COVID deaths in this country. I am not in any way suggesting that COVID isn't serious. I was managing my team through the COVID efforts at Northwell Health in the spring, in the height of this pandemic. I assure you, it is in fact very serious. My point here is to demonstrate that we do not live in a riskless society. We go out every day and we make choices that have a far greater risk than sending our children to school. So when I see that study after study come out and they show us that school is the safest place to be, why does it take us so long to open full time? Why does it feel like our opening is so haphazardly in last minute? Why weren't we ready for this? You might remember, I asked that question in October meeting, what was our plan to reopen? More importantly, what have we learned since September? I asked the board for data on quarantining for those who turn positive, because quarantining alone does not mean that we are stopping the spread. If those quarantining have minimal transmission rate, then those efforts did not actually contain the spread. You know what did contain the spread? It was all the work that all of you have already done, the masks, the barriers, the social distancing. You haven't just met New York State and Nassau County guidelines, you have exceeded them. According to the Nassau BOCES website, which I believe has a strong influence over all Nassau County school We're at districts. three minutes, I'm just giving you a three minute warning because okay. I was given it. I get it. I'm really trying to be respectful in all of this. I just want you to know, but I do feel like I'm voicing a lot of concerns here in a very respectful manner. Um, but according to, but thank you. But according to the BOCES website, and I'll try to go through this really quickly, direct contact or close contact is within six feet of a positive case for 10 to 15 minutes. And then the obvious exposure, touching, share food and all that. But the asterisk below is very clear to say that this also assumes that the appropriate PPE has not been utilized. And we know it is mandatory in our school districts for children to wear masks. According to the Nassau Department of Health reopening guidelines, they say that six specifically appropriate social distancing means six feet of space in all directions between individuals or the use of appropriate physical barriers. And our district has already made that investment. So my question is, why are we quarantining all of these children? And so I'm gonna skip ahead to the end and say that I implore you and I beg you to please reevaluate your contact tracing. This is not September. We have more information now. Please recognize the phenomenal job that you've already done to keep our kids safe. The data shows that. We heard tonight that 926 that were quarantined from in-school contact tracing, 13 were positive. That's actually a rate of 1.4%, 1.4%. And we actually, when we talk about 4% transmission, that's just 4% of the positive cases that were in school. It doesn't actually mean that they didn't carpool with those same classmates and got it outside. But what we do know is 926 kids quarantined from school, 13 were positive, 1.4%. So going back to my original plea, listen, I know more than anyone that this district prioritizes mental health more than any other district I've seen. I've seen it firsthand. I'm proud to be part of a district who broke down the barriers of mental health access, who became a pioneer among school districts in this entire country to become mental health partners. But going back to my original plea, suicide is the second leading cause of death. So please don't ask me to continue to isolate my children and prevent them from socializing. My child is actually statistically proven at a much greater risk of dying from suicide than COVID. The public shaming, not from the district, from the entire community needs to stop. And we should all encourage social safety responsibility, absolutely. But to suggesting we continue to isolate, in my opinion, is just the wrong message to send. So, thank sorry, you. thank you for letting me go thank over you time. Very much. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Matt. it. And I know, I know it's, it's a lot of information and I know it's a lot of opinions and we appreciate yours. Thank you. Anybody else like to ask a question or make a comment about the budget? Erica Messier, 493 Rose Lane. Okay. Um, I just had a question going back to the idea of playgrounds. Um, we know that children learn best through play. 
We know that play is linked to increased collaboration, creativity, community, and play also has a lot of health benefits. We see less fatigue, injury, and depression, more agility, coordination, balance, flexibility, and even has impacts within the classroom shown to improve attention and academic performance. So if play is so important for our children, I think it's kind of important that we consider what opportunities we're offering our students to have 60 plus minutes of unstructured play. What resources is the district providing these students? Now, I can only speak for a covert because that's where my child goes to school. Um, our playground is falling apart. I mean, I know pieces of it have been fixed, but there are still pieces missing. The plastic, the ropes, they become more and more brittle every single year. Um, I am the co-president of the PTA, and I can tell you this year we have spent probably about $6,000 on recess supplies for the students. We bought balls, jump ropes, basically whatever was COVID safe. We spent $3,000 on paint and painted the blacktop in the back area and the kindergarten playground to offer the students COVID safe activities. And we're happy to do that. I think we might have enough money to buy a playground, but we're not allowed to do that as a PTA or it's unadvised by New York State. So my question is, is there money in the budget for a playground? If not, what can we do? I know in the district that I work in, we have friends of groups that are formed through their board of ed has a policy that these groups can be formed, they submit a mission statement to the board, the board either approves them or don't, does not approve them, and then those board, that the group's focus is fundraising for a specific cause, maybe a sport, maybe a playground. Is that allowed? If it is allowed, and we were to form a Friends of Covert playground group, if we raised the money and gave it to the board, would it come back to Covert? We want to do what's best for our kids, and we have the funds to do it. We just need to know what the pathway is to get it done if the district is unable to fund a playground, because it's something that's really I'll let Robert answer the friends of question, but mm -hmm. I will let you know that we part of what the board is doing by doing the mid-year tours and even the, the August and into September tours is part of that. So each going to buildings and saying, okay, let's take a look at everything, including the outside, including the playground equipment. So I know just having from gone to some of these buildings, we've talked as a board of, we have to start replacing our playgrounds. I mean, we have had this conversation. It's a matter of how many can we get done? Do we have to put them on a rotating basis? Do one a year? These are conversations we've definitely had. We've also had grants come in that we've had conversations about. Could we move this one up to the list? We have to kind of maybe prioritize a bit based off of which ones are in the most disrepair. Mm -hmm. um, but I will let Mr. Bartels answer your question about funding. Um, that, that's out of my um, you know, knowledge base. But we are looking at them, Erica. Uh, that's definitely part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I do want you to feel assured that in the capital improvement line, it's something that we do consider heavily because we agree. Playgrounds, especially elementary schools, especially now, yeah. they're really important. So yeah, I think it's more of like timeline, because I yeah. know since my daughter's in third grade now, right. since she's been in kindergarten, this has been a big topic at right. Covert specifically. So okay. yeah. it's just kind of I like a, a win. I'm not giving you a specific no, no, answer on schools, yep. but I want you to know we're looking at it, mm -hmm. and I'll let him <laughs> answer you on that. Uh, I just want to start by saying we, we have had uh, our insurance company checking over the playgrounds recently, and I know there is a piece of equipment at Covert that right now is out of use that is in the process of being uh, repaired. Uh, to get to your question about uh, the funding, yes, you could donate funds. Uh, in fact, that's how all of our play, current playgrounds kind of came to be somewhere around 20 years ago, right around 2000, we upgraded uh, playgrounds in, in all the buildings, and I, I believe all of them were funded through the PTAs. Um, I, I know it becomes an issue for the PTA if the PTA does the installation, so the PTA would donate the money to the school district for that purpose, and then we would spend the money on the uh, on the installation of the playground. So that's that's how you would work it. You, you would donate to us with that purpose. You wouldn't put in the playground, so that yeah. removes the liability from the PTA. So if we were to make a very large gift to the Board of Education for a covert playground, we would be ensured that that money would go to a covert playground and not to Riverside or somewhere else? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other parent like to approach the mic? Okay, thank you very much. Move on to, um, before I go to the board actions, just want to highlight a couple of things um, on the docket for tonight. We are looking to approve the draft calendar for 21-22 school year. Um, so the calendar option that's available on our website is a September 1st start. Just want to highlight that. We did discuss it at, um, even last year, about this year, but also last meeting. Um, the other thing that's um, up, just to, to explain, nominations for the BOCES board. We get those every year. This year there are three candidates, um, all incumbents, correct, Mrs. Wong? Um, they're all people returning, looking to um, run for their seats again. I don't believe any um, outside people are running. So just highlighting those two things. So I'll ask for a motion to approve the minutes from the February 9th, 2021 meeting. So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, can I have a motion to approve the financial reports as listed? So moved. A second? Second. Uh, any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Can I have a motion to accept the receipt of financial reports as listed? So moved. A second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. And then um, we had some additions here, so we're gonna, I'm gonna look for a motion to approve board actions a through F, and F includes a PAR and a PAR addendum. I have a separate one after that. So can I have a motion to approve A through F, which is including the PAR and the PAR addendum? So moved. As revised. Thank you, Mrs. Wong. Yes, the addendum as revised. Um, I'm sorry. You said so moved, Mrs. Barry. So moved, a yeah. second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and then we have um, another PAR addendum two. Can I have a motion to approve the PAR addendum two? So moved. A second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm Aye. opposed. Opposed. Okay, thank you. Okay, and we do not need an executive session. We already had one, so I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Our next meeting is going to be next uh, Wednesday, March 3rd. That's our public forum on reopening. We'll be joined by a panel including Mrs. Algerio Vento, Mr. John Murphy from the high school, Ms. Sheila McGinn from the middle school, including all of us up here. The meeting following that will be March 11th, which will be a public work session. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? A second? Second. Okay. Good night. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.